Peace and blessings. We are live. We are here with conversations with Brother Asar. I am your host, Asar Mhotep, with the Madhu and Della Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. Uh, I'm here with the, uh, a good uh, panel of friends and colleagues. Uh, we're actually doing a, almost a kind of a chain gang uh, hangout today. Uh, we was on two other hangouts earlier. Um, some hours ago, and we didn't want to stop the conversation, so we're hopping from uh, hangout to hangout. So uh, right now we're on my hangout, and we're just continuing the conversation. We was first on Brother Unk show, um, the real black atheist. Then we went to Brother Jonathan Smashwell's uh, page, uh, YouTube channel, and now we're we're here. And so uh, we'll probably do a little recap a little later of the, the kinds of conversations that we were having earlier so you can catch up. Um, but uh, we're going to, we, we were in essence talking about meta uh which is the writing script uh, representing the language of, or languages of ancient Egypt. And the direct uh, engagement of primary text and what that means for scholarship. Um, and then uh, the usage of African or Pan-African cultures to uh, study ancient Egyptian and we went you know in various other different directions and so um, on the line here we have brother Wujawu Irimaat, we have brother Jonathan uh, Smash, I don't even know where we get the whale from um, Smash Rockwell, sorry yeah okay so Rockwell uh, you know, I think that's just uh, Brother Unk's way of uh, introducing you, so it's caught on to me. Uh, and then we have Brother Unk Aket, you know, with the um, Amara Squad show. And I should say that Brother Jonathan's with the Magi, um, an uh, Amara Squad affiliate, I guess. Ujawu, Uh We have Brother Ishmael Bay on the line with uh, also with the Amara Squad. We have Brother Issa. Um, I don't know a uh, particular organization he represents, but uh, Brother Issa, all the way from the UK. And we have Brother Garfield, uh, all the way in New York City. Uh, we have Brother Dauhu, um, who I don't know where you're from, but welcome to the panel. And then we have, uh, well, the screen name is Black Power. Um, not sure what you, you go by. I'm sorry? That's Brother Bourne. Brother Bourne? Yes, sir. Peace and blessings, and welcome, Brother Bourne, and uh, welcome everyone on the panel. Uh, we decided to start this conversation with a question from Brother Issa, and uh, even though I kind of remember it, can you please restate your question so we can uh, engage in a, a, a possible answer to your question? Hotep Salam, Brother. Peace, peace. Um, basically, what I wanted to know was, are we any closer um, to knowing what the first language was, um, like what what its grammar was like, the, the syntax, you know, the, the words monosyllabic, or you know, do we have we got any idea of what the first language human beings spoke? Um, to somewhat answer your question to my knowledge no um, we we the vast majority of linguists do not believe that the our methods and tools of analysis will allow us to trace the first human language and you know we got to remember that at least according to you know um, biological anthropologists that you know humanity is several million years old uh, throughout its various stages now the last stage of homo sapiens sapien that itself you know is like 170,000 to 190,000 years ago and so you know that's a long time to try and trace back uh, you know if the human language uh, so to speak you know but I will say this that in our other conversation we evoked the name of brother Jean-Claude Mboli who was a linguist 
Now, with his reconstruction of Negro Egyptian, um, you know, he did the reconstruction in his 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 2010 book, the uh, African Origins of Language, or the 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 Origins of African Languages, uh, which is written in French, and but what he doesn't do is try to date his reconstruction, you know, and so that's a different process and a different set of issues, and so he was just focused on reconstructing Negro Egyptian. Now he has three stages to Negro Egyptian: uh, archaic Negro Egyptian, classic Negro Egyptian, and then post classic Negro Egyptian. And and so the post classic Negro Egyptian, you know, is within, you know, our relative historical period. You know, um, you know, anywhere between, you know, um, four thousand to probably ten thousand, you know, BC for some of these languages and, and places to develop. Um, however, the most uh, the oldest node of this Negro Egyptian is is interesting, um, and I and I guess this gives me an opportunity to share something with you, um, because uh, let me let me share my screen for everyone uh, to see. Um, share. Let me hide that. Let me click on me. Can y'all see my screen sharing itself? Yep. Okay. Now, um, again, this is from um, some some translation work. Uh, so it's some of it that I included in my uh, book, Where Is the Love? And, you know, even though it's a book about love, there the first chapter is totally dedicated to linguistics. Um, because I'm arguing that the word love in English actually is an African word. And um, and so I have to demonstrate linguistically, you know, why I would even um, go there in the first place. And so, but what I want to share is Jean-Claude Mboli's Reconstruction of Negro Egyptian. And, and I'm going to get back to the dating. And so I haven't forgot about the dating. But... <laughs> Again, as I stated, there's uh, Negro Egyptian or Archaic Negro Egyptian, which broke off into three branches: branch one, branch two, branch three. Uh, branch one and branch two became Kweki, a Kikwe. This is the classic period right here of Negro Egyptian, with these three branches. Then um, some convergence and interaction between these branches, mainly between these two, but relatively uh, at some point even with this one. Um, and then these two continue in, in their dialectical sphere. And so we have the Bere and the Beher branches, which we talked about earlier. Um, and so, you know, the languages that belong to Beher or Bere is Hasa, Zande, Manu Egyptian, Bantu. Um, and then Beher, Coptic, Shango, Somali. And because Middle Egyptian and Coptic were in such close proximity, they even shared lexicon and certain other features. Um, as a result, and it is, we believe, that um, out of this third branch here, that Semitic ultimately arrives, that this group of people migrated out of Africa, as we understand it by its modern borders, and into the, uh, the Middle East, and met up with some other native speakers, and their convergence created uh, Semitic, and also a little further up, Indo-European. Um, so that's neither here nor there. But so now this goes to answering your question specifically, um, Brother Isa. Now, and he's going to come back on the show and actually explain all of this. So he had to get some other work done, and then he's going to come back and and do a full lecture on this. And so this is this is this is not all of it and what I'm talking about here. But again, as I stated earlier. Negro Egyptian is broken up into three primary stages. Archaic, which is the beginning, the classic period, and then the post-classic period. And so what distinguishes, what, what Mboli argues, is that all of Negro Egyptian, all of these languages here, are built off of 
these, I think it's a total of 10, monosyllabic onomatopoeia words. And so y'all know what onomatopoeia is, do y'all? Nope. <clears throat> okay. Onomatopoeia are words that are the the sound of an action or attribute of something to that nature. So for instance, when someone says, Oh, you're a cuckoo, you know, uh cuckoo is supposed to be the sound of the quote unquote cuckoo bird. Or like when you're playing basketball and you hit a J and then you say swish. You know, swish is a word that imitates the sound of the ball, you know, hitting nothing but net. Or as we say, nothing but net. Um, and so it's, it's these sounds that imita imitate stuff that we call onomatopoeia. And so what he argues based on his analysis is that Negro Egyptian and all of these, these languages are built off of these onomatopoeia. And so this word here, K, which is a sound of, of wood being cut or a sound of a cracking of a dry branch. So if you can imagine that, like if you, if you broke a branch, a and then you have who, action of blowing or breath. So somebody running, you get what I'm saying? Now this mm -hmm. other one, this other one here, tree. You know, which is supposed to be the sound of, I guess, somebody smacking, you know, or chewing some food. So, and then this other kind of uh, who here, with this uh, other type of, I forgot what kind of you you call this, with the action of smelling or sniffing, like, <laughs> and then you have the sound of emitted from the throat, <laughs> grunt, you know. So remember that this early stage, you know, it's not really full-fledged languages. It's just grunts, you know, <laughs> and then from there, you know, languages develop. And so this is what he's arguing. And so yeah, yeah, you know, and this is a uh, uh, this is a this is a N with a G sound pronounced simultaneously. So it's like yeah. So like if you imagine, and so it's a baby sound identified as. Uh, a call is supposed to be a, a call to his mother, as call to his mother. And so if you, you hear a baby, nge, 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 that's what that, you know, comes out to. And then, kui, the cry of uh, shivering or to thrill. And then you have these, these three vowels here, which is the I, which is the indicate, indication of remoteness, or there. So they say e, like when saying something is over there. And then this U, indication of proximity, something that's close. Ooh. And then A, indication of size, uh, and, you know, bigness or indication of far away, something of great size or whatnot. Ah. And so this leads us to phase two, going into the classic period. And so now phase two, the indication of hunter and gatherers, begin to see a combination of these monosyllabic words to articulate more complex ideas. Therefore, what we call the process of agglutination. For example, you know, um, this word becomes a word for game. So we're at the hunter-gatherer stage, and now we're we're hunting game. So we have these words. Um, so you know, this word tweet becomes the word for meals to to eat. So we call we call it all what we can eat tweet game eat. And so there's a, there's um, there's a thing in linguistics, you know, where you know early verbs come from nouns, you know, and so the process of eating, you know, uh, comes from the you know the action of the mouth, which is why the mouth or the tongue is associated with speech even into the modern day. And so a lot of this stuff is still detectable because we have the same semantics. But then you start seeing like combinations of words, and so like hoo hoo. Lung. So remember, like, remember that um, when Brother Wujawu was talking about, you know, to that they, you know, if you just did all ideograms, you would have a problem with trying to identify, you know, other concepts beyond what you could draw. 
And so even verbally, the early African speakers, the early Negro Egyptian speakers, I should say more specifically, you know, of course had this problem. So they solved this problem by combining words or combining various forms of this, these, these uh, monosyllables and then creating new words. And so kehu, you know, here is the sound of dry wood being cut. So it is their indication of wood and, and breath. And so, like, if you ever hear, um, like, fire, the sound of fire when it's being burnt, it sounds like it's a breathing or, uh, like, a crackling sound and stuff. So they're, they're combining these. So um, wood and, and breath, and this combination creates the word for fire, and then it later on becomes the word for sun. So that's why in ancient Egyptian, for example, you have ra, fire, ra, Sun. You know, they come from the same root. You know, then we have like Kiku, Javelin, Lance. And um, I forgot where this uh, initial key comes from. But, you know, when we start talking about breath and all that wind, you know, we start to see, you know, different things here. Kiku, chief, leader. It's a word for head and things of this nature. And then all of these other kind of more abstract ideas, you know, come as a result of, you know, and this is still coming from the same um, words as this here. You get what I'm saying? And so uh, fire and sun, and then the, there's other combinations. Of course, we're dealing with heat. And so when it's the dry season, it's the season of the sun that we have here. And so you, you, if you can understand these 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 things about uh, early African languages, uh, or at least early Negro Egyptian languages, you know, stuff will start to make sense. And so now we get into phase three, which is, um, you know, the, the post-classic period. And then out of that, you know, we're still doing some word combinings, but now we're getting into a specific type of grammar and, and other more complex combinations you know, of words, um, you know, by putting these monosyllables together. And Excuse so... Me, what, what, sorry, what were the dates for um, for the first and second set? Do you have any dates for that? Well, he's he told me personally, so he doesn't have this in his book, but it's going to be in his next book that he's working on. And so what, what he's arguing is at least 50,000 years for mm -hmm. Negro-Egyptian uh, archaic. And so this is significant because this is around the time that allegedly, you know, Africans were leaving out of the um, um, out of Central Africa, uh, Ethiopia, into um, uh, Arabia to go into India and populate all the way down to Australia. You know, and. Um, but you know that's a different combinate uh, conversation. But I just wanted to want to show you that there are linguists trying to answer certain questions. Now he's not dealing with trying to trace the first language, just what the evidence will lead us to as it regards Negro Egyptian, from which the um, the ancient Egyptian languages, you know, like Coptic and Middle Egyptian, derive. <laughs> and so you know, trying to help people understand was like I spoke about this in Aluja. The, how there's a concept called a meaning chain, and and I and I cited you know, uh, I think it was James P. Allen who reminds us that the ancient Egyptian language, it their vote is it's not that many words in ancient Egyptian, it is they'll it'll fool you, because it's really different languages being recorded, and so you have different variations of the same word or they'll combine certain monosyllabic roots to create other words. And so, um, but when you really analyze ancient Egyptian languages, they're not very vocabulary rich. And, but because they come from this kind of language family that does this type of, of, of systematic associations, you know, based on characteristics and creating new words, you know, built off of these roots. So, um, I'll just read what I have here. You know, in the third and final phase, words become 
even more complex as roots and now archaic proto-lexemes, which combine to give the modern structures that are based on three or four primary lexemes. However, to find the mono and disyllabic structures that are familiar to him, the Negro Egyptian speaker will contrast these complex words by showing new phonemes. So we have a certain amount of phonemes that were created in the beginning, but we need to expand our vocabulary because we're witnessing more in life and we need to associate words with it. And so now they're utilizing their mouth to, to create new sounds, to create new words. And so um, uh, the first example that comes to mind is the word for wood, whose meaning is so enlarged, or there's an expanded meaning, that it was necessary to involve the word previously used to denote the tree, uh, to name it. So we have the following semantic process. A becomes B becomes C. Here ABC uh, denotes tree, wood, and tool respectively. So tree, wood, tool. And so remember that it's the combination of these words, these monosyllabic words, that bring about new words. So I have a word for tree and then I add another word to it and it becomes wood. Now if I want to add another word to it, this same word becomes tool. Are y'all understanding me uh, thus far? Somebody can um, agree or not, they have questions. Uh, I, I was just going to say, when you said um, you add another word, that's uh -huh. the bit. I thought I thought you were saying it's the same word, and then it it had now has yeah. another two meanings. Yeah. So it, what, it, we'll we'll get to that. I'll be a little bit more clear. In in I'm just saying this to give you a summary, and then we're going to get into the details. And so, what happens is that it, it'll be from the same root, but that same root we'll have another word just like like we have here. The root here is K, you know, for um, uh, the sound of dry wood being cut. It's the word for wood itself. But then we have this other word here that's added to it, which is a word for breath. And so they're saying like breathing wood is a word for fire because fire is associated with the burning of wood for the, for the early African speakers and early Negro Egyptian speakers. And so we got to understand that how we think today is not how our ancestors thought. They had a totally different word association process. It's still detectable in the language, but we don't see it the way that they saw it. So when they see fire, they see wood breathing or a hot breath from wood. And then this combination also becomes a word for sun. The sun is a big tree being burnt. For these early African speakers and so you know but in this process the, the monosyllabic word here will combine with another word but it'll still have this root and then become the word for wood Then this word for wood will become the word for a tool that you would make from the wood that came from the tree and so therefore the word for tree then becomes the word for wood the word for wood then becomes the word for a tool that is made of wood I just said that these roots are semantemes, which are meaning units that are distinguishable from a morpheme that has a grammatical function in a word. The principle of economy in linguistics works in a way that languages consciously seek methods to optimize features in a manner that is easily transferable from one generation to the next. In the case that interests us here, we can analyze the movement of the semantine as triggered by the moving to the right of the semantic center of C uh, above in our meaning chain given by the example ABC above. By doing it, it leaves free the meaning of wood. And so if, if, if we just left the same word here as it was, then it will be kind of hard to distinguish between the word wood and another word. But if we do something to this word and we'll add something here or there, to the same root, then now we have a word for tool and we still have, we don't have to replace our word for wood. I hope you're getting that. And the same thing with the word for tree, even though they come from the same root. So, so now we see this example here 
where um, the box left vacant by moving to the right of A will be filled by a complex form, a more complex form, Kiku K, which from the very fact that this movement will partly cover A and B. So Kihu, fire, day, dry, heat, etc. And so all of these come from the same root. And so when we add that final K to it, it becomes a word for log fire or wood for the fire you know, in a, in a more complex, you know, structure. And so um, this is, you know, kind of the stages in how things have developed and why we get those trisyllables that you see that we spoke of earlier that we uh, believe where the Semitic comes from. It comes from that process of, of you know, these, these monosyllabic words that came here combining in these two and then in this stage it becoming triliterals. And so um, the difference is that there's no accentuation on any of the mon uh, the syllables in branch three of Negro Egyptian, which we call Kikuki, but there's accentuation either on at the beginning or at the end of the word in the Kweki or Kikwe groups. And so um, anything beyond that will be going beyond you know the initial question, but I just wanted to show you that you know there there are linguists trying to to answer those types of questions but is only as far as the data will allow us to go so his 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 language uh, his his dating for Negro Egyptian is you know and it may change by the time of publication again he's he's still going through this so this is just a personal communication at this point which I'm just conveying to y'all but um but you know he was saying for the archaic stage you know 50,000 you know uh years in in uh, with his methodology and and so with that you know we see these different stages you know and and how they become um complex and the kinds of sounds and phonemes that uh came as a result so i'll i'll stop there so i'll, I'll let other people talk <clears throat> Hey, hey. Go ahead, Ujo. Oh no, I was just I was just commenting on the silence. <laughs> no, I wanted to say something, but I'll let you go. <laughs> you know what else says. Go on. You about to say brother Smash? I was going to say that. By the way, I saw Imhotep. I knew the meaning of that word, but I didn't want to say I did. Okay, whatever that word was. Oh my no, but whatever it was. All right. <laughs> That's for the record. <laughs> on the mouth of I know. I, I mean, I wasn't trying to be. Uh, if if I came across that way, that's that's. I'm, I'm not. I wasn't trying. I was just trying to make sure that before I move forward using the terms, that people know what I'm talking about. Because you know, sometimes I say these terms and I keep forgetting I'm not speaking so, so, to people who who deal with linguistics that way. So I got to make sure. But bro, yeah. if you already know this, why even mention the word? Just the same, you know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know an al un Unfortunately, I don't know an alternative. Nah, well, use any word you want, bro. Use any word. Yeah. We know what it means. We know well, etymology. Everybody here knows etymology, and we we have a dictionary. So hey, hey, everybody. but check this out, man. Google. You got and we got Google. You got you got you got you got to keep in mind we are dealing not not the panelists on on here right now, but we are dealing with people who 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 can look at a bull and still call it a cow, <laughs> and um, you know. Look at a third grade drawing picture and still say, you know, call a cat a pig and expect the cat to drive him to the store, you know. Oh, uh, since it's, it's since it's shameless plug Friday, I would like to read an excerpt from my book. I'm just going here. I got two questions off you read. Everybody can read the excerpt for their book. I just need to get mine in. Match out the handbook for the conscious community. Yo, put, hey, put it up there again. Oh yeah, for real. Well, actually, you know, uh, uh, a lot of the information in here could be found uh, publicly at my articles if you just want to review my work. Articles at rapguide.wordpress. Cover designed by my brother Ujahu Ari Maat. So that's why I'm looking so good. But you can't judge a book by the beautiful cover. You got to go ahead and buy the work and see if it's really substantial. Uh, if you want to review some of the articles, you can just go to rapguide.wordpress. But for the most crucial. My last year of research, I obviously didn't release it publicly, so... 
Hey, you no. know what though? Hey, John, I meant to ask you, uh, cause I I, I noticed like in the when whenever the topic is addressed, man, it's 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 got to be like a chapter or a page number that that we could just start referring to, um, as far as you know, a lot of these different claims, like where wherever you address the arit or the or the um, you know, the back the the what is it the the whole claim. Um, yeah, I got, yeah, I do, I do have a direct actually. Uh, that's I put papyrus uh, text two three eighteen was on page two forty four. So if you want to start breaking them off, just say, look, man, go get the handbook and see page two forty four, because <laughs> that's where I address what I call the missing link, which was pyramid text three eighteen. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. So yeah, two forty four in the handbook. Yeah, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start doing it that way. That's why, cause that's why I asked you on on Facebook. I asked you. Has has anybody got got the book and actually addressed what you what you're saying? You, 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 you I know you already answered me. You said not yet. You waiting? So, um, you know, I don't know why people are still talking about those claims if they're not willing to actually read the work. Yeah, well, that's another thing. I don't I don't normally see, uh, and I'm not on that. I'm trying to be snooty or not, but I don't normally see too many. Uh, published authors just dialogue with anybody who want to critique or knock their stuff without a valid legitimate claim pinned out in a, in a proper fashion. And so sometimes we just access ourselves to people who don't even have a genuine intention in learning or anything. They just want to rattle you a bit. So when I learn how to, uh, to weed through the genuine people who are interested in what at least I'm trying to bring forward and the dudes who just want to hate, I'll probably, you know, Feel better ground you, know, you know what's interesting though? I think that's uh you know, I'm like torn torn in between on that. Because a lot of times uh we not even allow access to certain people and they and that makes them seem like they bigger than life and the reality is, you know what I'm saying, you just want to reach out and talk sometime. And I, I think you know the access we give people, I mean it's it's a two edged sword on that. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I think it's kind of cool that you can kick it with some brothers that they wrote some real good quality work. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes the people that's actually trying to question, they don't really recognize what they got. Because like you said, man, you got published authors. They're not, they're not going to – you, you can't even talk to Wesley Muhammad. He don't want to talk to you about his damn book. Matter of fact, he'll make a declaration when he come on the show, we're not going to talk about that book. I never want to be that type of person. Ever. Yo, I never, go ahead. No, I'm just saying I never want to be that type of person. I want to always be accessible to the public. You know what I'm saying? And I mean that that's that's what I think. And I think it's good that we can get on a hangout and get you know get smashed book and talk about them. You know what I mean? Same with a saw. I, I think that I think that's the difference between us and you know the way a lot of other people did. I know Dr. Ben and them. You can get the access to them. I, I just think we bring it back that good old fashioned flavor, man. Well, you can talk to the people that actually wrote the goddamn book. Yeah, I got you 100% on that, and that's kind of like uh, aside from what I'm discussing. Uh, let me just say it like this. Coming from, obviously, coming from the music industry, it's the difference between people be like, oh, yeah, you need to say what's up to every one of your fans because you know you do, right? But if you're in a building of 20,000 people and you're headed for the exit, you will not make the exit. <laughs> at the count of trying to speak to every one of your fans. So it's kind of like the same principle, even though this is not physical. A lot of shows we do, we never get to get to the point of the show because we get side railed or sidetracked by uh, someone's request or inquiry that ain't no normally, you know, it ain't on topic all the time. I got the solution for you, Unc, though. Uh, you know, like you said, it's a two-edged sword. Like a, It's like a curse and a blessing. You know, we, we, could, we, could, we could be available... I mean, people could be available to each other, and the community can, you know, vibe and interact. But we need that filter, and I think Asal Emotep's uh, uh, suggestion is best. We need to set up a SAT evaluation <laughs> <laughs> system. <laughs> you know, in order to have some dialogue, you got to pass this test. You know, have you know, we got to name it or something. Uh, use 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 you know, ESA cool. as the test the test um the test <laughs> bro, person. My you test would be ESA so high, exam. bro. My test will be too high, bro. Watch my next question now. Watch this. Brother, hold, also. On, hold, on, hold on, hold on. Before you ask, oh. I'll let you ask. Okay. But I just want to say this, that, you know, um, I hear everyone's position. 
And I think that, you know, as Brother um, Unk, uh, is alluding to, that we need to find a critical balance. And, and I think that to credit, to the credit of Wesley Muhammad, I understand where he's coming from because he's basically, you know, dealing with the same thing that we're dealing with, where it's just a gang of people who haven't read his works want to challenge him on stuff that he took care of in, you know, uh, or at least he, uh, he feels that he answered, you know, in his text. And so you can tell that somebody isn't taking the time to, to study and ask important questions. Now, the difference, like I remember Dr. Greg Carr, Greg Habathi Carr, he was, he, had, there, he, was at some, he was doing some lecture and he was talking about the first times that he met um, Dr. John Henry Clark, and he said that you know he was in such an awe with the individual that you know he wanted to ask him questions, but he didn't want to ask him ignorant questions. So he made sure that he studied Dr. John Henry Clark's works, and then found questions based on his works. And you know that's that that kind of culture is the kind of culture that I was brought up in. It's like you can't ask somebody about you know their their works unless you're really kind of familiar with the the school of thought, and you know you've done that literature review or you've read their works. So like for instance, when I met um, Dr. Muba Binge Bololo, um, you know, or, or first came across Dr. Muba Binge Bololo, I first got a hold of his name. I never heard of him before until I read Milana Karanga's book, My. <laughs> and when I read the book, he cites uh, Bilolo a couple of times. And, you know, I was, I was liking what I was hearing from Bilolo, but I'd never heard of him before. And so, um, you know, Milana Karanga is, you know, one of them inaccessible individuals. So, you know, I just you know, looked around to see if I can, if one, if Muba Binge Bololo was still alive, you know, that he wasn't citing some, you know, old literature of somebody who's died, and if so, if I can contact him. And so um, I ended up finding him, contacted him, you know, uh, asked him where I can get his works, you know, um, I got one of his books, you know, read the books, and then from there, I actually started, you know, asking him, you know, some serious questions. And it's from there that he started building, you know, and feeding me more information. And he actually gave me some of his books, you know, when we um, when we first met when he came to the United States. You know, he gave me some of his books. So I'm reading them, I'm digesting them, you know, and then I'm coming with, you know, certain types of uh, questions that is relevant and based on what he's he's actually said. And then from there I was able to, you know, make my own contributions and we was able to, you know, be able to build and um, uh, from that particular um, point on. But it, it comes, what I'm saying here is that one, there was a respect for the for the researcher. And what I'm seeing in a lot of these discussions is that these people just don't have respect for the researcher. And so if you have respect for the researcher, you would one, at least read their works, you know, before having a negative commentary about it. And then, you know, once you've read the works, then you can understand everything in its full context. Then you can then you can formulate your opinion, you know, on it. And so we had that kind of issue earlier with Brother Laurent, you know, who clearly hasn't read these works, but then he wants to interject and do all of this other kind of stuff and have arguments about the work that he's never read. And we see what kind of problems that is. So they don't respect um, the, the, the researchers uh, and this is the kind of thing that we see. But um, Brother Issa, you had another question? Okay, it was sort of like in two, I guess the first one hopefully which will be a oh bit shorter. Oh um, he mentions, shut up you, he mentions um, Negro, or you mentioned Negro Egyptian, mm -hmm. but when you were referring to, I think it was the Ten Sounds, um, they seem to be more when he says Negro Egyptian, is he referring to the, the what? Sorry, they're words. Words. They're just onomatopoeia words. So they're, they're okay. not the phone. They're not phonemes. They're words. But go ahead. 
<laughs> okay. So, because from my perspective, the people that went to or spoke Negro Egyptian, how is he is he saying that these were the people, or this is the language they spoke before they moved to Kemet? As in, this is the the most ancient language of those people. Is that what he's doing, or is he going back to the most ancient African language? That's what I'm trying to no, get. No, that's, that. that's that's what I'm saying. You can't. It, the language is too old to trace the most African. We don't know when speech started amongst human beings, but that's what I'm saying. The closest that we can get to something relative to your question is the work kind of what we're doing with Negro Egyptian. Now, there's this other languages. For for instance, I mentioned the Nostradicist. Now, the Nostradicists are linguists who comes out of the Greensburg camp who believe that there's this kind of super mega language family which a lot of these phylums belong to. So Nostradic is the language family or the language phylum that allegedly includes Dravidian languages, Indo-European languages, Afro-Asiatic languages, and Uralic languages and possibly Caucasian languages. And so they've been working over the years for a few decades now, you know, trying to uh, argue that, you know, this Nostradic language phylum actually exists and that this is, this is where all these major, you know, language uh, families or phylums come from that I mentioned earlier. And so, you know, it, is, it, it, it has a following. Um, there are a lot of linguists who don't agree with it, and Bowley's one of them linguists who doesn't agree with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of back and forth on the merits and, and the methods, but that's just, you know, um, just one of many, you know, people who are trying to trace this human language to see if we can we can get to the 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 first human language. And so, um, you know, I. I, I I'm not trying to be long with it, but, you know, in, in essence, but no, he's not trying to trace the first African language, only Negro Egyptian that he can establish as a language phylum. And so what he's saying is that it's very, very old, um, you know, in the languages that we have now, you know, not all of the African languages, because Mboli's strict. And so unless you have fully tested the language, you know, you cannot include it in uh, you know, his Negro Egyptian. You know, the only exception that he has to that is Bantu because Bantu has went went through that process itself. And so he, he did some Bantu languages in there and, you know, was able to determine that these are Negro Egyptian languages. And so, um, so you know, that's that's that. Um, so but I, I'll, I'll, so I'll is open he, it up he, to somebody. He, Hold on. I'll open it up to somebody I else who may have a question. Yeah. And then, you know, if they don't, then it will come back to you. Or anything to say, yada yada. Going once, going twice. Okay, Brother Issa, continue. <laughs> yeah, so my second question was, um, is it fundamental that they take into account psychology when studying linguistics? And if so, how much of it? Um, I argue that linguistics is, in fact, a branch of psychology. And, mm -hmm. um, but uh, in terms of the psychology aspect of it, there's a concept that we call semantics. And semantics deals with, uh, let me, I know I have it more properly defined in here. Um, so man, uh, um, here we go here, um, and w so I want to properly define it for the listening audience. Um, okay, what is it doing here? See, I hate when this. Um, this hangout is up because it does something freakish to my um, programs. Um, 
but anyway, because it's 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 acting funny real quick. Um, the the semantics fundamentally is the psychological way in associations that groups make as it regards uh, lexemes and words. So, for instance, um, I don't know why, brother. Un I'm muted in Missouri. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, um, the, for instance, in the Semitic languages, there's an association between tongue and speech. So when you hear, for example, in the Bible, when they're saying that you know people are speaking in other tongues, they're saying that people are speaking in other languages. The semantics is that there's an association between language and tongue. That's the semantics. Now, in the African languages or Negro Egyptian, they have a different semantics on the, on the African side of Negro Egyptian, and that is. When they talk about speech, they talk about the mouth as a whole. So that's why, for example, when you look into the Egyptian hieroglyphs, the word for speech is used um, is the same word for um, mouth, or has at least the root of the word for mouth. And then the the symbol that is used is not a tongue; it's a mouth. That's a semantex. There's another semantex between sun. And day. In Negro Egyptian languages, the word for sun is the same word for day. When you get into Semitic languages, it is not the same word. They, they're, they're seen as two different concepts. But again, going back to ancient Egyptian, um, like with the, uh, what's the word for sun um, in a Semitic language? Um, Shumps. Shemesh. So I'm trying to see if that's the word for, but the word for day is something different. Yom, uh, Yom yeah. and Shemesh. Yeah, so Shemesh is sun, and then Lom is the word for day. So it's two different words. But when you get into Egyptian, for example, you know Ra, as I mentioned before, is a word for fire, flames. It's also a word for sun, and it's also a word for day. And it doesn't matter what word in Egyptian you have. That, is, that has those points, it's the same thing. So when you say shu, there's a word shu. Shu is a word for sun. Shu is a word for day. Same thing with heru. Heru is a word for sun. Heru is a sun for day. So all of these come from different languages that were in, uh, in the area that contributed their lexemes to the, the, uh, the writing script but you can tell that these are all languages that belong to the same culture that had the same type of semantics, the psychological mapping. And so, for instance, uh, the last one the example that I'll give is that the word for uh, sun or light and stars is the same word uh, for spirits. And so you find this semantic or it's the semantics, for example, in Egyptian, where the um, the quote unquote Aku, you know, become the blessed stars in the heaven. But the reason why that is the case is because they have a psychological association with spirits and stars. Now, when you go into Africa, it's the same semantics, and the semantics doesn't necessarily have to be dealing with the same word. You know, it's the same associations. So when you go amongst the Zulu, when you die and you are, you know, a, a pure being, you become a star. When you go into the Congo, when you die, you become a pure being. They have this word called Malang. You, that's a, a word for a, a star and one for um, a venerated ancestor. You know, it's the same semantics. Same thing we would get amongst the Yoruba. Same thing amongst the Akan. You know, these people become uh, uh, natures. And remember that the word nature also means stars. And so, you know, this is what helps to shape 
the country. So this is how we can tell what groups cluster together because they have the same psycho the same psychology, even if the words are different. And so this is how we know that the the Semitic languages it comes it, it is developed with a people with a totally different semantics because their word associations their concept associations are not the same even if they have different words I mean the same words as you find with these other inner African languages it's their psychology that's different and we see it mapped out in, into their language well that was my point where I was for me, I feel that evolution, as in your environment, which shapes your thinking and therefore determines the way you express yourself. And for me, it's like I, I don't see how anyone can separate psychology and even anthropology for me from linguistics. But I don't know. I mean, what's you know the main study that's done in that manner where those three are linked? I want to ask. <coughs> Well, I've done my own independent studies, and then it was reaffirmed again um, with Mboli's work. When you read Move by Bengi Bololo's work, he fundamentally does the same thing. I use the word semantics because I, you know, if you read my earlier works before I got a hold of Mboli's work, um, I didn't really have a word for it. I, I couldn't find a word for what it is that I was noticing, and so Mboli had that word. And so that's why I use it. But when you read, um, you know, in, um, Muba Binge Bololo's work, you know, you you find the same psychology. That's one of that's one of his major, you know, points in terms of linking band to with um, ancient Egyptian. Is that when he goes into his language and he knows his culture and his people, he sees the same associations, word associations, and concepts that he sees in his own native land. In Central Africa, you got to say something, brother. Unk? Yeah, I just wanted. To, um, I was gonna let y'all finish. And I wanted to uh, kind of uh, throw some science in on the uh, conversation because uh, y'all was talking about like the oldest languages. What I what I would like to do is I'd like to give you this. Uh, see if I can share my screen real fast. Let me see. Let's put some science on it because the brother was wondering like, okay, what's the oldest language? And um, so I kind of want. <laughs> You're frozen, bro. Is it? But I, ain't. I, I think he froze. His um, he probably had to. He probably be back. But hey, I saw until until Uncle Cat come back. Could you um, could you give an example using the word um, Earth, like how how the psychology of the Arctic type of environment differs from the tropical. Uh, environment or how they even view the earth, how you can how you can tell which people are clustered together in their lifestyle. Uh, as far as the earth example is concerned, matter of fact, that's one of the points um, that I make in this book that you know uh, that the Semitic and Indo-European, whoever that indigenous group was in those areas, you know they have the same semantics together and one of them is with the word earth so Indo-European and the, um, the Semitic languages even have the same word for earth you know which is a word for dust dirt you know but for example when you go into the Congo when you talk about earth they call it Futu and so Futu is a sachet you know a um, what do you call it like a little bag you ever see Africans they have like a little bag, you know, strapped to the side, um, you know, with the, you know, especially in traditional societies, and you know, the chief, uh, will, uh, the the priest or whatnot will have medicines and stuff in it, and so they see the earth as a a living organism that is is a sachet of medicines, and so that that this it's a psychological difference between you know groups who just look at the earth as dirt or rock as we find in Indo-European versus the central Bantu you know languages that um, the, the word for earth is is the same as a sachet for medicine and so you know when you you're trying to this is one of the reasons why I use linguistics 
in my analyses because it's just a means to an end. What I'm trying to get to is what you know Issa's alluding to is the psychology of the people. And the psychology of the people is always going to be mapped out in their language. And um, and so you know this is this is one of those those differences here, in in how they treat and how they view the 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 phenomena, and how they name the phenomena in which they interact with. And so you know imagine if we had a word for Earth that you know alluded to this is our source of medicine. How would we treat the Earth in the final analysis? Will we just, you know, abuse it in this way? Will we be cutting down endless trees uh, and things of that nature? You know, we probably wouldn't. We would probably have a different psychological relationship and and um, with the with the earth. And and it's because of these kinds of pairings, uh, psychologically and linguistically, that you know the it it breeds that kind of culture. Um, I think that. And matter of fact, I can. Give you later but um but I don't want to take too much time. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say that that's good because um I, I try to use the same example and, and and then I always add to it that the the opposite equivalent or the equal opposite of that would be how the Indo European societies view a dog. Like they, they treat a dog um however they, they assign the meanings of dog being a man's best friend they they treat the, a dog better than they would treat the actual planet Earth, and this is why people could go to jail for like six years for dog fighting, but yet somebody gets two years for killing a human being. So it's almost like you know the value and the psychology behind the semantic meanings that they're assigning these different things and in their, in their views. Could I add just a little to that? Go ahead. Uh, being a fisherman, I noticed that it actually steps out of the uh, arena of linguistics and into just strictly psychological justification of the things that you harm, damage, or affect. Uh, I brought this out from the what I uh, determined is a pseudo science saying that fish can't fill a hook. It goes back to the same thing. I ha I hate to take it so off track, but if you see, it's all in the spirit of of uh, you know what I'm saying? Some taking from uh, certain and detaching. You know what I mean? Fish can't fill a hook, and so now it's cool to uh, treat them in a certain manner or just do what you want. And I just don't even believe that's real. Uh, I mean, so it's kind of like off on a tangent, but it's sort of like still on the same psychological aspect. Even though I took it out of linguistics, it's still the same attribute psychologically. All right, brother. Um. I see you got your screen shared. Yeah, I wanted to kind of throw a little science on the situation. Uh, dealing with the evidence of the origin of our language in Southwest uh, Africa. And um, the data, the data presented is uh, very, very important. And like, y'all know, I like to study a lot of uh, Stone Age cultures. And um, so I'm kind of understanding where they're coming from and I'm understanding the population where this would have derived from. So the article uh, speaks on, uh, this is April 15, 2011, by D. Atkinson, the University of uh, Arkansas, New Zealand, reported evidence of the origin of language in South Africa, right? And it goes on to say, uh, human genetic uh, uh, phenotypic diversity declines with distance from Africa, as predicted by serial founder effort. Now let's deal with what serial founder effort is, right? Come right here, all right? It's talking about the population genetic. And genetics, the founder effort is the loss of genetic variation that occurs when a new population is established by a very small number of individuals from a larger population, right? Now, what's important about this is what, what we know when we study, we start to realize is when you start to deal with diversity, as something gets farther away from the source, it becomes less diverse. And so this is one of the rules, right? If you're looking for farming, if you're looking for the origin of, say, like farming in certain seeds and grains, you will look for the population of that seed that is the most diverse. Okay, if you find where this seed is the most diverse at, right, then you're pretty much finding the origin of it. Okay, and so when you're dealing with languages, right, based off this particular um, 
an article is trying to show you that as language spread out, it gets less diverse. As a matter of fact, uh, y'all can go to science. Go to science, you can ask for the, the actual article. Okay, so I start here at this particular website, right? But I don't take them at their word. I find out the actual origin of this article. And so it's kind of a little methodology I've been using, right? Then I find the actual article that this particular thing was written off of, and you can see that right here. And it's talking about the human genetic phenotypic diversity decline of the distance from Africa as predicted by the serial founder effort in which successful population bottlenecks during the range expansion progressively reduces diversity. So as the range of the language expands, right, it reduces its diversity. It goes on to say, support for an African origin of uh, uh, human modern uh, languages. All right, this is very, very important because as our linguists show, right, that languages do start out in Africa. But it's always important to kind of back that up with some type of uh, scientific uh, yeah, I just want to kind of throw that in there for the listening audience. All right. Now, the uh, what I would add to that is, you know, we got to make sure that it's a distinction be, because uh, I read that uh, article some years back, and, you know, it's primarily making the argument based solely on the presence of phonemes. Absolutely. And, and so the, the, the phoneme, uh, the greatest phonemic, uh, uh, phonetic diversity, you know, is found in Southwest Africa amongst those those San and Koi Koi type people who still have the clicks and things in their languages. And so the belief is that this was something that would um, have, like, the early languages had something like that, and then you know the surviving group of languages you know, are from a group of people who diverged from that and lost it. Like it's a single group of individuals. And from that single group of individuals was, uh, you, know, um, the, you know, the rest of the planet populated from. And so what's interesting is that they, you know, um, or at least this group of people, you know, have, uh, and, and it's been shown in other areas, that they actually reverted back to hunter-gatherers. And um, that you know they they and they were forced that way because of other more taller Africans invading spaces and things of this nature. But that uh, these hunter gatherers, you know, like the clicking sounds. Uh -huh. what they suspect, what they suspect is that the clicking sounds came about as a result of, you know, having when you're hunting and gathering, you can't talk really loud. So it's just like smash, smash. You know this. Um, that you know you can't be having loud conversations fishing. Correct. You know you you have to be quiet and stuff like that. So how do you communicate with some people at a distance? You know that there's some game over here and this without scaring you know the the deer or something off. You know so you 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 do stuff like you know so it's just like just. It's, it's loud enough to be heard, but not loud enough to startle, you know, the game, the, the, uh, the, the game or whatnot. And so this just became, these sounds just became part of the phonetic, uh, phon uh, yeah, the phonetic inventory. And so, you know, the, the process of hunter and gathering, you know, contributes to the nature of the language and even uh, the phoneme diversity. So just like with Mboli, talks about here about that hunter gathering stage being critical for Negro Egyptians, we can see uh, or at least it's proposed for the Khoisan that that hunter gathering stage was critical in the development of at least its phonetic excuse me, yeah its phonetic inventory. And so but well, I just wanted to make the distinction as a distinction between you know the phonetic inventory and saying that languages started in Africa, which we would assume any damn way since um, all human beings come from Africa um, versus can we trace and organize and reconstruct the first language now that's something different because now we we're getting into meaning you know in, in terms of semantics and and then you know creating those words so they so you know that study dealing with phonetic inventory and then making a um, uh, deduction from that 
and then the um, uh, the 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 work of reconstructing the first human language, which is which is something that you know no one has been able to do at least convincingly, you know. But then you got you got these pseudo cats who swear that you know all languages like uh, the sister uh, rest in peace though, um, Catherine Ochilanu who swears that all human languages come from Igbo. And then you have the brother, uh, you have the brother out in. Um, uh, from Eritrea, uh, who swears that all languages came from Amharic uh, and and Tigrinya uh, languages. Uh, the brother Legacy, Alan Legacy, if you're familiar with him, he has a new book out. You know, claiming that you know uh, Indo-European comes out of Amharic, and that you know all languages in the world basically come from Amharic and Tigrinya languages. You know, it's just craziness. With no, and none of them have done any kind of systematized analysis to make, you know, uh, their claims. But they they publish works with these claims, and so this goes into just because it's published, don't mean it's right and exact. You know, you you have to be able to scrutinize this method. And then uh, you have me, to me, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, yo. You say York say all languages come from the Wabi. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's 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 seriously a, a group. Um, you know, there's some claims that uh that language comes from extraterrestrials and that extraterrestrials came here and taught human beings how to speak and, and so on and so forth. So uh, you know, I just put it out there. That's LeBron. That's LeBron James too. <laughs> Yo. Yes. Yeah, If I could, uh, you know uh, to a point that you were earlier, can y'all hear me? Uh, to the point you were making earlier when you start talking about the clicks and you reference uh, being quiet during fishing, which is another attribute that uh, you know don't stand that during fishing. But I want to explain thoroughly what I meant at first. It was more in reference to you saying how they psychologically placed the dog as the man's best friend and then elevated its status. In their in their psyche, where it's worth more than our computer. You're you're fading. Okay, uh, y'all got me now. Yeah. I, I guess I hope it's a little better. Well, anyway, how they elevated the status, and if it's not, just cut me off. How they elevated the status of the dog? Well, I was offering. Uh, opposite end of that spectrum, and, and, and linguistically, I guess it would be what we know as game, or uh, game, animals classified as game, to where for some reason we came up to this, uh, with this knowledge that they're only here for game, for us to, uh, not even, they're lower than prey, I guess, uh, game animals, where the same has happened with the fish is what I was saying, is basically they developed this pseudoscience that fish don't feel and I was only mentioning that to say that it was kind of like at the opposite spectrum of where they elevated the dog since they wanted to, you know, you feel a guilt about uh, fishing and overfishing. When they came up with some pseudo concept, like, forget it, fish don't feel hooks. And so, uh, <laughs> I, I, realistically, it's labeled as the game animal. This is the, the opposite of the dog. They, they, they reduced it down to it's here for nothing but or, or to service us as food, so... Well, you know that is, uh, the, you know, the in the Abrahamic traditions, that is kind of what, um, I mean, let's look at it from the biblical standpoint, for example, to where in their psychology, man was, basically the earth was created for man, and that man was to have authority over all other living beings. And that's that doesn't seem to be the case um, in terms of consensus that I find on the continent of Africa where there's a sense of harmony or that you are you know one you know thread in the web you know of all life and you don't get this you don't get that same sense out of the biblical tradition you know and but what I would argue is that you know um, is part of that semantics again it's a different culture um, in my new book I deal with for example, um, let me just share this, and this may explain certain things. And so I want to I want to take this study further, and um, 
I want to take this study further and 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 show. Can y'all see my screen? Yeah. Yes, sir. We see it. We see it. Okay. So now, you know, we got to remember that you remember the earlier part of our conversation that Negro Egyptian speakers left Africa and uh, went into the Middle East and in, into the homeland of uh, the Indo-Europeans and merged with some indigenous groups and they became the, the Semites and the, um, the Indo-Europeans. And so, you know, we got to think about this um, in, in context. Like, who were these groups of people that um, became, you know, the, that, that was in those areas? And so, you know, you have some that are probably remnants in very small numbers, you know, from the first out of Africa event, but there wasn't just one out of Africa event. Um, but even still, okay, this map that I'm showing, does this show up pretty well? Let me hide this. Yeah, um, yeah, this, is, this is from National Geographic. It's a 2011, I think it was, uh, paper. And it's talking about how they have, you know, and, and, I, and I support it with some other independent studies that, that confirm genetically, at least using genetics. This is a genetic paper um, uh, or a genetic map based on, or a map based on genetic data from the researchers at National Geographic. And, and so, of course, you know, here in the Great Lakes region is where at humanity started and we spread in, into these, you know, uh, regions and whatnot. But uh, around 50,000 years ago, a group of people, and also this is where Negro Egyptian is, start, is argued to have originated, um, these groups left and went through southern Arabia and then traveled through southern India, you know, and populated, you know, East Asia and going all into... You, um, you know, the Papua New Guinea Islands and things of that nature. Um, but notice this node over here where Gujarati is. Sometime, you know, after this period when they settled some several thousand years, you know, later, a group of this, of these folks here in India split out. One branch moved up here and became your proto-Indo-European speakers, your Caucasian, you know, uh, speakers and things of this nature. People originally from Russia come from a different branch, but they're all coming from India. India's, India's their most recent homeland. But notice this, these lines here. You see how it's a back migration? Going back into um, to Africa, even Morocco, um, it's a group here of these Indians that you know end up in the Middle East and in Turkey. And so, what um, Mboli, you know, argues because there's two there's two primary arguments for the uh, the creation of Proto Indo-European that it comes from either over here in the, uh, above the Caspian Sea, somewhere over here, or it comes from Anatolia. And so Mboli's of the opinion, based on the Negro Egyptian evidence, that it comes from um, that these groups, you know, um, in terms of the, the indigenous speakers of these areas, you know, were in, uh, for Proto-Indo-European at least, were in uh, Anatolia, Turkey, and then moved up here and then spread. And so, you know, it, regardless, it would be the same people. And so it's these same folks here in the Middle East. So when these, remember that this is a long time ago. They've had time to kind of change their perspective. They're in different environments. They're not interacting in the convergence zone with these, these Africans to keep the same psychology alive. So things change over here. And so these folks with a different psychological and linguistic makeup, you know, migrate here and, and settle and become the people here. And so these Negro Egyptian speakers, you know, um, come out, you know, from this area and populate and, and, um, and interact with these native speakers. They merge their languages and it becomes proto-Semitic. 
Some kept going further up this way, and it became Proto-Indo-European. And so we wonder why, for example, with the example that I gave, why Indo-European and uh, Semitic have the same word for Earth, and some other words that could be traced to both Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Semitic. Because they both come from the same uh, area, you know, from the same people that migrated out from um, from India, and so you know, the pale white skin is a more recent phenomenon in his in history, anywhere from six thousand, no later than twelve thousand years ago. So that's four thousand BCE to eight thousand, oh no, to ten thousand BCE, that white skin actually develops. Before then, they were kind of different shades of light brown, kind of what we see, you know, in kind of northern India and stuff to this nature. The more darker folks, of course, in the south, um, dealing with your Dravidians and things of this nature. And these folks move all the way. So this is how, you know, people want to think that, you know, all the, the different colored speaker Semites, you know, is a result of invading, you know, Europeans and they just, just adopted all of these languages. No. These folks been pale for a very long time, and and these Africans merged with them and created these proto languages. You know, anywhere between four thousand or three thousand eight hundred, no, three thousand five hundred BCE to you know forty five hundred five thousand BCE. So proto Indo European, proto Semitic are not very old. You know, in terms of these languages, and so um, this is what the genetic data. And there's there's some more. I have different maps, you know, on here and all kinds of other uh, linguistic data. And so, um, you know, there's, there's some very important work that we need to be able to to review, you know, in regards to certain of these questions. Um, there's a uh, there's also a new article that came out that speaks to the, the, the tool complexes that you was uh, you, you talking about the expansion. Well, when people expand, they also take tools with them, and they and I forget the uh, particular name of the tool complex, but but it it, go, it dates back to around fifty sixty thousand years, I believe, and it's talk it's the oldest such tool complex in that area, and, and they call them Nubian Egyptian. Now I know this is before the time of the Nubians and Egyptians, but but they're making it a clear distinction of who they are, and they kind of go out that route that you talked about, and they circle back through Palestine, back into Africa. You know what I'm saying? This is important. But another piece I want to add to that, right, we can actually get to the actual population. Uh, if you go back to 100,000, maybe 190,000, let me kind of share my screen here, all right, and it talks about, and I talk about the site, um, the cave site, at, I call it PP13B, right, and it's on my screen right here. Now, this particular population is doing a, a glacial stage at about 190,000. Where, where so far they haven't found any evidence of any other population outside of Africa that actually survived that glacial stage. So at 190,000 pinnacle point in South Africa, where where that particular article kind of speaks speaks to that's what they think language uh, kind of originated, or not the language or, or, or the funding, like you were saying, brother. But the point I want to make is this particular population is the actual seed population for the rest of the planet. And so we can kind of put that those two things together and kind of uh, like zero in on, well, why South Africa? Well, South Africa, it was uh, rich in marine resources during this particular glacial stage, like shellfish. Uh, they find uh, iron okra for color. So you got symbolic behavior here. You got actual uh, uh, dealing with heat, keeping heat at a certain temperature to melt the iron okra so, so they can uh, better work with it uh, in symbolic uh, ritual body painting. Uh, they also talk about kind of like a lunar counter system, okay? Um, so read this particular article right here, all right, um, and just do your research so we can kind of put all that together. So at the end of the day, you know, I like to really stay in this area because it kind of separates uh, me from a lot of the foolery, right? So in these, these particular areas, we can d definitely deal with all the rudiments that would later on become someone else's religion. You know, like butchery. So when you're speaking in terms of butchery, you're actually speaking in terms of what they want to call sacrifices. Okay, so when you're speaking in terms of butchery, you're talking about people who learn the anatomy of animals through butchery. Okay, and then we know for sure that the Egyptians 
um, dealt with autopsy. Maybe later on I'll show you where forensics shows you that forensic science starts out in Egypt, okay, uh, dealing with cause of death and forensics. But forensics would have to come back to that original thing of butchery. So really, religions and things of this nature start out of man's need for survival. You need to be able to butcher animals. And in butchering animals, you find out the best way to butcher animals. Obituary animals will later on pop up in what they're calling sacrifice and forensics, study of anatomy in the body. I just want to kind of like throw it in there. Anybody else can jump in. Hey, okay, I got a question about what you just said. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, was that the same thing that you presented before? I know you you probably showed that before, but is that um, where the there was a there was a considerable amount of ice covering a large amount of the of the planet or whatever, and then and then it basically pushed everybody uh, or the survival survivors were at the southern point of Africa, and then at, at that point is where um, those people because they survived and they then they started back migrating, you know. From there, they started going back up towards the uh, uh, the rest of the continent and stuff like that. Let me, let me yeah. ask you a yeah. question real quick. It's part of that question. Yeah, Which sure. ice age period affected Africa? Out of all of them from, I'm talking about, you can open up the... Just Google the ice age and look at an ice age map, and I want somebody to tell me which one of those periods all truly affected equatorial Africa. All of them. All of them. Now, when you study glacial stages, right, and you study geography and topography, now, there, there, there isn't any ice on Africa, but the effect is it dries out Africa. So Africa is... Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't ask, but I mean, I affected it like an ice age, so I didn't phrase the question right. Which one brought ice into Africa? None of them. No. None of them. None of them. But, but it still has an effect on, 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 on Africa. Absolutely. The global ice has an effect on Africa. And the proof of this particular population is you find at uh, site PBB13. I'm glad you cleared that up for me and for probably anyone else who, because uh, that's a thing we were talking about the other day, and I asked Leron the same question. Yeah, Leron. Yeah. So, well, it's not just him, it's the way that they teach the ice ages as if they affected the whole world at once. Uh, and they affected the whole world, like you said, but not with ice uh, in, in mm -hmm. that regard. No, but it, hold on. It also affects the the, uh, the water because because when 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 a lot of the water is absorbed in these ice caps, it actually affects the oceans. So at uh, South Africa, you'll find uh, like right now, those portions of South Africa is covered up because the ice has melted and the ocean levels rise. So during ice ages, ocean levels drop. Okay, so these caves became uncovered during this particular time period. So when you study glacial periods, you'll, you'll see that it affects the ocean levels, right? And it also affects the climate. It makes it very dry and very uh, humid, and it makes it hard for food to grow, right? So these, these particular Africans had to deal with the ocean, okay, for their sustenance. And that's how they made it through. They're the first shellfish eaters. Matter of that's fact, good uh, one, Hey, that's are, are, so are we talking about the the ice age affecting Africa or 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 being in the African region when there were human beings? Or are you talking about no ice age affecting Africa even in the stages of Pangaea and 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 times after that? I mean, that's a that's a, good, a question I'm posing because I'm no expert in this at all. So I'm kind of like I have this theory that as, as I looked at the maps that equatorial Africa was not affected by ice as much, but someone could just simply teach me right now and let me know. Right. And, and equatorial I'm telling you, global thing. You, you yeah. can't separate the planet as, as a living organism. And I'm telling you now, if, if, if you have a, if someone's shooting your damn foot, they might not have shot you in your damn head, but you're going to feel it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like the ice affects the whole planet, whether it's ice on Africa that's not that's not the case. The point is that the ice actually lowers the sea level, right? It absorbs water out the oceans, and it affects the climate in Africa. So Africa is affected by the ice in other places, and it makes the climate very dry and very arid, and it's hard for things to grow. There is no food supply, so populations literally die all over the earth. That, that I mean, that's a 
that's a good study for everybody to check out. But go ahead, Asal. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, it's because of the Ice Ages and the, 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 the end of them that brings about, uh, brought about the different um, uh, periods in the Sahara. The, ice, the last Ice Age is the reason why we have ancient Egypt in the first place. Because remember, the, what, what happens is there are typhoons that come out of the uh, Pacific uh, Indian Oceans that affect and bring rain. The rains actually used to come all the way to the Sahara. And this is when you have the green period. But at the end of the Ice Age, when all the moisture and stuff was dried up, uh, 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 absorbed you know, back into Europe, it dried out the, um, the Sahara and the Middle East. And so this is what pushes the migrations. Now, this is what pushes people and forces them to migrate out. And wow. so with the Nile Valley, what the suggestion is, is that, you know, this was one of the last rivers that, um... See your uncle man in that casket like that. Off a little of nothing. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is the reason why, you know, you have all of these different groups converging on the Nile. In the Sahara, they had many different rivers rolling through it. And so, you know, the Nile Valley wasn't any, any special than any other, you know, um, uh, area of the Green Sahara. So the, the population in the Nile Valley was small. But as soon as the, the, um, the Sahara began to redesertificate, then, you know, you have people spreading out. So this is why, you know, these cultures that culminated in the Sahara, now they have been pushed and spread out. So now they're moving into places like Nigeria. Chad, um, and then others into the Nile Valley itself, um, um, and 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 into the Delta, you know, say in regions or, um, or or whatnot. So you know, it's very critical to the um, to the history of Africa to understand these these things and and the migrations. Matter of fact, um, in Fu one of Fukiao's works, he cites an early um, in early writing in 1911 that was done, uh, it now survives in microfiche in, in France, where they were interviewing a Bantu speaking um, uh, chieftaincy, and of course, they're the record keepers, you know, they, they know their history going back several thousand years. And in that text, in that interview, He's saying that, you know, our people come from a place called Kalinga. And Kalinga was way far to the north. And the reason why we had to we went through the forest and everything is because there was a big and long lasting drought from the forest. So the Kalinga, which they figured out, is where the Sahara was. So that's what these Bantu speaking people was calling um, uh, the the Sahara, and it's it's funny because we find the same word in ancient Egyptian as a word for um, uh, fire, for dry, for a uh, uh, torch, or to cook. In ancient Egyptian, it's it's kalinga, and um, and so you know this is one of my uh, among many pieces that argue that Bantu people, because everybody keeps wondering well, what caused the Bantu migration. Well, I argue it's because of the desertification of the um, the Sahara that these people migrated up along with the rest of the Negro Egyptian speakers, you know, into the Sudan, into the Sahara. When it started drying, these people moved back down, and so some continued on straight down into the forest and and, and settled in the Congo. Others moved right back towards the um, the Great Lakes region which, you know, some of their ancestors were still living, which is why we have two different branches of uh, Bantu languages, you know, in terms of what we call the East and West branch that, that, are, that are different, you know, because these represent two splits from, from the, um, the Sahara. And so, um, you know, just wanted to add that piece. That piece. But yeah, I, and I definitely wanted to emphasize that, you know, we went over ice ages, you know, in anthropology, when I was in school, you know, I mean, we went over the Karoo Ice Age and things like that, where there was ice covering, you know, parts of Africa during certain phases for for many, many, many years. 
So I was just trying to figure out what time scale we'll be talking about with the ice coverage. I mean, it does snow in Africa, and I've seen the snow on Mount Kilimanjaro personally. So I know that it's, you know. But that could be due just to elevation, not necessarily. Because they're, remember, you know, Europe's cold is because of their proximity to the North Pole. Correct. But, I mean, the Karoo Ice Age, uh, K-A-R-O-O, that's, that lasted for, like, like I said, like, you know, millions of years. See, I'm glad you brought that forward because that's why I posed the question and told you how I ain't no expert. I wanted somebody to tell me uh, what it is. So I got to look into You said C or K O O. How do you spell it? Yeah, K A R O O, the Karoo Ice Age. Yeah, and it brought o ice on to equatorial Africa. Yeah, it was de yeah, it deals with a lot of the, like when you're studying the mineral bands of, of what's connecting parts of Africa to South America and stuff like that. You, you start studying those mineral bands of, of that's where it connects at, you know, when they were connected during that time. So I was just trying to figure out the time scale that we were talking about when it was human beings and the whole migration part that Brother Saw was talking about or we talking about prior to that or that it never took place at all. I would beg to differ just knowing and studying the evidence of, you know, just things as simple as trilobites and things like that. You see the connection of how these fossils took place. That's no, with the with the last the worm glacial period, um, you know that's in you know relatively recent um, history, and so it's because of that, you know, and the desertification that um, people started picking up pastoralism, um, and this is actually kind of the origin of certain themes that we see in ancient Egypt concerning Asar, in the rise of Sirius. And so in the early days, like if you have the book, I think he goes into this uh, quite nicely, uh, Robert Braval in Black Genesis. And he's talking about this to where when they first saw Sirius rise, you know, um, in the sky, this wasn't an indication at first of the river rising. It was an indication that the rains would come. So Asar being associated with water was first associated with rain. And you will see various different cognates for the word for rain, you know, and uh, uh, Asar. But as a result of the desertification, the monsoons used to reach all the way up into the Sahara. But now they only make it as far as, you know, Ethiopia, Congo, which is why there's rainforest in those areas. And, uh, and so from there, the, the spirit of the rain and water isn't associated with rain. It's associated with the Nile River. And and so this is why, for example, Osar, Osar is the king of the underworld because he's water. And for them, the water came from underground because they're dealing with a lot of underground water because it doesn't rain in Egypt. And so it's the rising and, and, and lowering of the, the Nile River. And then there's a certain point in the river where it looks like the Nile River coming from up from the ground. Not from like you know like falling off of a mountain, and so because the SAR is associated with water, this is why this is why you have this um, association with him coming from the underground, as well as you know um, his his name also sounding similar to a word for underground. Okay, you know, this is the way that uh, uh, weather in 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 essence creates culture. Let's let, let's go back to that rain and water Sahara. Um, the rain actually doesn't have anything to do with the ice age. The rain actually has to do with the tilt wobble of the earth, right? And and that tilt wobble happens every maybe five thousand years, I believe. And it ha and it can happen fast, right? And so and and how do how do we know this? What they did was they took sand, they 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 took tubes in the ocean, right? They put these tubes in Atlantic Ocean. Okay, and they stuck them down in the ocean. And they pulled them up. They broke the tube open. You can literally see the periods where you have green in the tube, right? When it's green periods, and then you'll see brown in the tube, right? When it was very dry and very arid, and the sand actually settled in the ocean because it was so dry, right? And they count and they measured it and they counted. It's like a five thousand year period. What they felt was is that the earth tilts, and when it tilts, the monsoon rains go back down south. 
And when it tilts again, the wobble tilts again, the monsoon rains come back and water the Sahara. So you have this 5,000 year switch back and forth, back and forth, based off of the wobble of the earth, based off of them taking uh, cylinder samples from the ocean. This is critical in understanding these brothers and sisters, right? They also have cave art, right, which is my funnest uh, uh, research, right, that clearly show people swimming in the Sahara, swimming. Okay, and then it shows people who, who are actually trying to pray for rain. But you'll find them, you'll find their bones stuck in that cave. So it was those who, who used their natural order of things who followed the animals because the animals know when the Sahara is starting to drop. They leave, and you'll find humans migrate with them. And then you'll find some people that, that kind of sort of kind of thought they could make it rain and would draw things and show hands trying to make it rain, but they are the ones that died. So that's an example for us, yo. We need to always keep it natural. Exactly. And um, just to reiterate, like, again, certain deities we know have a have a have an earlier um, function because Aset also, you know, being a, a, a feminine um, mirror of Asar is also associated with water. And it's interesting that she's always talking about... Um, uh, they're, they're, they're pouring out water. But how can they pour out water if they're associated with the river? Rivers inundate and flood. They don't pour anywhere. The only way that you can pour something is if you're at an elevation. And so they still have some of the old stories that are fossilized in certain characteristics in Egypt, um, but they, they aren't... Uh, uh, they don't have the same potency because you know, certain uh, events. Like, for instance, Heru is associated with thunderstorms and lightning. How can Heru be associated with thunderstorms and lightning and it don't rain in Egypt? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it, these are fossilizations from a time mm -hmm. when it used to rain in the Sahara and in those areas. That's a good point there, Saul. That's a very, that's a very, very good point. And it's just a lot of things that they just not telling us, right? And, and, and that's why it's important for us to start to put these publications together. I'm working on mine right now. It's important for us to, to reiterate on these things over and over again because in, in, in most history books, they'll always say that Sumer brought civilizations to Africa, right? But when you start to really start to put all the things together, uh, the, the controlling the fire, not just making a damn fire, I mean, a damn's not a cuss word, so I don't stop. <laughs> Look, controlling fire. You know what I'm saying? Meaning, 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 keeping fire at a certain temperature. Okay, that's science. Okay, when you start talking about making tools, right? Uh, bowls. Uh, dealing with uh, 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 cognitive behavior. Okay, farming, like they found Sargon in a cave that date back to over 100,000 years. These are the things they're not going to tell you, right? And what did they find? They found it on grinding stone. And anybody that deals with the harvest know that you got to grind the wheat. Or you got you, you, you to gotta grind the, 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 um, the, the, the grubs. You grind them down, right, so you can make them into whatever you want to make them in. But this goes back to 100,000. They won't talk about that. They won't publicize that. You know what I'm saying? So it's important. All the things that make up civilization, it is clear it happens in Africa. You know what I'm saying? As of 2015, you got all this, the makings of civilization and culture, but yet they'll, they'll take you all the way to uh, uh, Babylonia and say, this is where civilization started. That's a bunch of crap, man. Hey, so I, if if uh no, I had a question for you. All right, but before uh, you you ask that question, I just want to say for the record that technically, damn is the only cuss word because it means to curse. Yeah. Everything else is really just derogatory. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Okay. Go. Um. Uh. Hopefully, it's in the same same stream what we're talking about, and that is there's some confusion. About the you know the DNA maps, where 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 people migrated and who's who on the planet Earth or who's who in in Africa, but it's it's mixed with the question of the Bantu language, and the mm -hmm. perception is Bantu is a modern 
a very young language and so on and so forth. So how is it that we can say that Proto-Bantu or whatever, where does it fit in the uh, scheme of things with Negro Egyptian in terms of uh, kind of like a linear time? That's a good discussion. Shigeti, and then Gozi had that one. Go ahead and saw That's going to be a good one right there. That's a damn good one. I mean, one. if you, I mean, if, if, I, I mean, if, 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 if that's a subject for a complete hangout, then you, yeah, we could, yeah, yeah. We no, could no, table no, no, it. No, no. We can, we can we can tackle some of that right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I learned a lot know, from this I, morning conversation on that, though. Uh, I, I would say uh, I'm about to share my screen that uh, um, I need to find it. I, I I have it on my computer. Like there's there's an article I have that is talking about you know if the if the Bantu migrations happens the way they say. Then why doesn't it add up genetically? Like you would expect in a in a good linear series that it, from Nigeria, you know, all the way down to South Africa, it would be a just a continuous, just in a series, you know, of datable, you know, uh, spots. And that's not how it is. Um, let me go back to. Uh, hold on. You know, you got all kinds of stuff going on over there, brother Aunt. Let me uh, oh, mute your yeah, mic. Um, my fault. <laughs> I got a slumber party. It's Friday night. Uh, but um, again, this is this is coming from my my book. Um, Where is the love? And of course, it's a linguistic book. You know, I deal with relationship stuff as well. But you know, it's you know half academic, half social. Um, but there's a, a, a point in here where I'm demonstrating that, you know, um, the word love is, is African and that the inverse of the word love is where we get Murray and that Murray is actually a variation of what we call Mott. And so, um... I don't know if this was a hangout we was having. I think this was with uh, with Jabu Issa, but it wasn't on the public hangout because um, we were talking about the uh, Mott. Um, I'm trying to do this. So I'm here dealing with Mary Love, and then okay. So uh, in in the text, I argue. That this word here, marry, you know, to love, like, to wish, to desire, yada yada, is just a variant. That this word marry, this is a triliteral, I mean, a biliteral here, MR, this is supposed to be the um, phonetic complement, and the uh, plural uh, was actually a, um, well, it, it could be a, a, a suffix of agent, you know. Um, but uh, supposedly allegedly missing a T, you know, here. But this is how it was in the dictionary, and I just um, got it the way it was in the dictionary. Uh, but you see these vari these variations of the word um, Mary. And so what I'm arguing in the text is that the root of the word Mary and Ma'at are the same. One, one they have the same root. And that the root is a monosyllabic R. Remember, this is a different type of R sound, but an R nonetheless. That this is a, a K or H sound. And then, of course, this is a prefix M of abstraction. Here, if y'all can see that. And so, um, this is one of the reasons why I don't think, for example, that all of the phonetic complements were just a complement that these were actually how it is spelled. This will be with two R's, two, two R's and a, and a W. Because even if you was to go into, um, you know, Coptic or whatnot, uh, and these other variations, um, let me see, you will see, no, I don't have it in this one. I should. Oh, let me make sure. No, I don't have it. This is somewhere else in this text. Um, I'm not going to worry about it. Because we're just dealing with Maat. I was dealing with Mary. Uh, yeah, I don't have it in this one. Um, it's, it's somewhere else. 
in a text, but because uh, I'm dealing with friendship. We'll see it again, but we'll see that even in Coptic, it has both the L's or both the R's in there. But anyway, um, this goes to your question. And so remember that, you know, okay, this is Dr. Theofalo Wabinga's alleged cognates for the word mod, which comes out of his 1992 book, The uh, Ancient Black, excuse me, Ancient, uh, ancient Egypt and Black Africa, a student's handbook for the study of ancient Egypt in philosophy, linguistics, and gender relations. And so, you know, he equates, you know, um, Ma'at, you know, true with Cushitic, Moyo, motive, reason, Congo, Moyo, life, soul, mind. Um, he's actually right here, but he's right for the wrong reasons. Um, you know, Ma, magic, medicine, you know, all of this stuff isn't right and exact to me. The, to me, this is his series here is unconvincing. And so, but I put it in here anyway, um, so people can see. But, you know, who I lean more is Dr. Alan Anselin, who's an Egyptologist and linguist out of the Caribbean. And he has an article here, uh, The Words of Genu, uh, Full Bay, Cushitic, Nilotic, and Egy Ancient Egyptians. Um, and so there's a section in here where he's dealing with ma'at. And so he says ma is good and sweet. Uh, ma be good, be right, and kashitic. And so we see here that, you know, it's actually M-A, and then you have this glottal stop here. And so what he's arguing is that this glottal stop is the actual, um, if y'all can see, you see this grapheme here? that I have here which is uh, represents the vulture sign but this is the phoneme for it so this by way of a process that we call palatalization um, hold on um, provides this you know this particular glottal stop and so it's ma ah and so, so the, that other the ma, yeah the, the ma right the m the ma before you get to that so it's like ma, right yeah ma like I don't know how to, because, you know, we don't really say the glottal stop in English, so it's kind of hard for us to say. Right. It's an actual phoneme, like in Arabic. Arabic has a glottal stop. Right. That's an actual phoneme. Right. Um, and so in these languages, it's, it's used as an actual phoneme as well. And so, but you notice this. You see these long A's here? Right. This lets you know that there was an actual consonant behind it that was dropped. And so one of the things that I argue and, and I'm going to show you part of the proof now is that, again, when we say ma'at, that's not really pronounced ma'at. These are all consonants. The ancient Egyptians didn't write their consonants. And so it's a tri, this is a tri, uh, not literal sign, but a, a tri-syllable word. Ma, ma, re, ki, yeet. You know, this is a suffix, eat. And so, you know, you have the M, the glottal stop, which was the R sound that was palatalized, and then we're missing here the K sound, but which becomes Q kind of here with the glottal stop missing, you see, and be good, be right. In, in, um, what's, what language is that? In uh, the, the kingdom of Jinjero and Cushitic language, you know, entertainment of rightness. So he talks about here, full, full day demonstrates the palatalization of the glottal stop. Um, Cushitic and omotic and turns into this Y. So this is that, you know, moi and moi. Be good, be filled with thanks, mercy, blessings. Be well, kind, generous. Um, blessings, greatness. So it's moye, moyere, moyango. Be charitable towards someone. So when you're talking about ma'at, we're talking about charity, not outside of the truth definition. As I said before, ma'at is not one single word, it's several different words that have different meanings that could conceptually be related to each other. And so more miyagi may give offer. Remember that uh, ma'at means to offer as well. So we see here may give offer, uh, muhigo benefit or uh, muugo goodness, yada yada. But so this now getting into where we're going to answer uh, Brother Wujawu's question. And so but you can see that, you know, these group of languages have, uh, it's, it's more so they pronounce it this way because of sound change. 
And so what we're going to be getting into is a phenomenon we call directionality. This is one of the rules in linguistics. This is how we can tell which one is older or not because of the, the direction of sound change. So, um, so this is a degraded form. But, you know, here I'm going to get into the, the, that this is an R sound. So this is the, the uh, phonetic, you know, rendering of this sound here which is an R. And so you can go to James Allen's work, you can go to Lopriano's work, and they all recognize this as an R or L sound. <laughs> and so um, Dr. Allen, Allen Atzelin again, this time in a different article, some notes about an early African pool of cultures from which emerged the Egyptian civilization. Um, this one was actually written in English. I had to translate all this from French. Um, <laughs> but you can see that where this sign is, because this is a, a biliteral sign here for BL or BR, and so you don't say ba, it's bel, ber, in terms of the this this word here. And so we look into these other languages that tell you exactly what the ba soul is. It's reason, sense, to be wise, to be intelligent, understanding. Your ba is your mind. That's all the ba or bar is. And so when we look into these other languages, it is your genius, spirit, in boco, in belly, belly. Actually, this actually needs to be switched. Um, but in the in boco language, it's belly, or bel, belly, hey, genius. Niger Congo in the Fulani language, imbilu, ingu, principle, of, uh, vital principle of man, which... Um, uh, which is like food to be devoured by the um, kind of like the beasts and the managers of the soul. Um, see also Anson and Anderson, yada yada. Semitic, Baal, spirit, mind. In Aramaic, Bil, spirit, intelligence. Northern Syriac, Bala, reason, attention. Arabic, Baal, attention, consciousness, mind. So when you're talking about the Ba, you're talking about your mind, consciousness. That's all that is. And as I said in the, in the earlier hangout when we were dealing with the papyrus of Ani, this is your double. This is what develops as a, um, when you're born. It's your personality. It's your, it's your way of being. And so we go down here for more proofs. We say Sia, but it's not Sia. It's Sia. And so we look in um, you know, languages like in Central Chad, Sir, to know. And this means to understand and know. And, and of course, is the God of knowledge. You know, um, Mary language, to know. Udlam, sitter, to know. Muyang, sitter, to get to know. You know, this word here meaning to see, to look, to examine. It's not ma, it's mel, mili, mer. Here in Cushitic, mili, to look, examine. Mal, to think. Mala, plan. Somali, mala, thought. Walam, uh, walamo, mil, to believe. Malet, to observe. So we can see everywhere consistently that this is an R or L sound. And so this is how it was in ancient Egypt. And so when we think about, you know, uh, ma'at, you can't say that's an a, a sound, that's an R. And so, you know, we compare this, and of course, in Chiluba Bantu, you know, where the, remember I said miri and ma'at are, are the same. So in this variant of ma'at, they don't have this suffix. This is a suffix, and we'll get into that in a second. You know, the word is munda, which is true in terms of uh, ma being true, real, right. This word is munda, and there's a, a law in um, in Chiluba where if the L sound is followed by an N, that means it's nasalized, the L turns into a D. So that's why you say munda instead of mula, uh, so to speak. But we, we know this, again, because here's a variant of the word milowo, milowu, agreeable, true, sincere, good, collagen, man, true. Uh, this third phoneme, this right here, in the word ma is a suffix and corresponds to the sounds of Bantu, n, k, or h, uh, from my 2013 work. Uh, for a equals k and g, we observe the following correspondences. And just as a side note for that word for bird, you know, this is where paronymy and the rabus principle comes in. That same word for dove and bird and all of that, in these languages, still has that uh, b, l, consonant root, B-L, B-L, B-L. So this proves, again, that that's an R, uh, an L sound 
in um, Egyptian. So we notice here that where you see this, everywhere you see this in Bantu, is going to be a K or uh, an NG or a G type sound. So in Chikam or uh, ancient Egyptian, this uh, which we would say is Arik, is not Arik. It's, it's kind of like what we say in Kikongo, Kalunga, complete or to complete. You know, um, it's not Arik here. It's Thai Bind. It's Kalunga again. This is a homonym. Two totally different words. It's Thai to Bind. Um, we say Unk, captive and oath, but it's not Unk. It's Kanga, which is here to tie up. This is the verb variant of it. Kanga. This is what it is. Kanga. And uh, we say Inganga, like the word Unk also means um, a priest in ancient Egypt. And so in in the Bantu they say Nganga. That's what that's how you would say Nganga in or see Nganga in um, ancient Egyptian. So um, the R's R's and uh, N's also interchange. R's L's and N's interchange. And so for here, uh, the R has been nasalized and they say Conco for arc, corner, angle, edge. Chiluba uh, is Tingu. And so the K sound is. Um, is palatalized and turns into a T. So they say the Tingu, the Tungi, corner, in Chiluba Bantu. Should have put that um, Chiluba on the second line. Uh, same thing with Unk Beetle. This K sound um, becomes palatalized and becomes J. So they say Chijangala, Chichangala, and Beetle. But in Kikongo, you see it here, Kiankan Kakala. This is a suffix here. You know, it's a K, K sound. This is a prefix. You know, but it's the same thing. It's a reduplication, you know, here. Ikoka, you know, uh, without the, the, the end pref I mean, the end, the nasalization of the end inside here. Same thing here. You notice that it's a, these are regular. The, you know, it's a series of these, so it's not random. This is a regular between these uh, two Bantu languages. So when you say I, they don't say I, to grow up mature senior. This is kola or koli which would be something in um, Egyptian, to grow, increase aging. And so here, to grow up, mature, senior, excess, over, differences in mathematics. The word for baboon, this is a K sound. And so the, in Chiluba, in Kima, that N turns into an M. N and M interchange, even in ancient Egyptian. And here's a palatalized form of that in Chima, monkey. You know, this is not na, compassion, benevolence. Uh, it's related to love. Um, this is Nanga, Bunangi, love, charity. And so we demonstrate that, you know, in uh, when we're comparing with Bantu, that this is a K sound, K-N-G or H sound, um, and that this, you know, uh, the A, the so-called, what we transliterate as A is an, actually an R sound. And so, you know, the Bantu will help us get to the heart of this. And so one of the things that we know when we're looking for cognates for Ma'at in, um, in Chiluba, that Ma'at is based on a root, a specific root. And I say this here that, you know, um, given the data above, we argue that, you know, Ma'a is true, real, right, Ma'at, truth, order, balance, etc., was probably pronounced something like what we find in the Basa language as Malega, truth. This is how you would say Ma'at. You know, in 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 its in its true older fashion, and so in Chiluba we say bulelela, or actuality truth. Malelela, malelela, malela. Um, this is without the suffix, the K suffix, but we'll sh the suffix will come back. And so siama, kama, siama, malelela, maye, malelela, or maiye. Um, is different other various ways, and you can say different variations of that term. And so what's interesting about it. <coughs> is that this root here is built off of this this root here. So this root, lelela, actual, truth, authentic, true, genuine, veritable. Now, <laughs> if this is the case, we should always we should be able to find this same root in ancient Egyptian. And as if y'all know me by now, I always find what I'm looking for uh, based on Bantu. And so when we go into Egypt, we see this reduplication. I should say, even though you see three L's here, Really, these two L's here belong together because this is a, a, a suffix that is reduplicated. 
And so technically it's only two L's. And and this being the um the, the reduplicated suffix, you know, here. So la 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 actual truth in Egyptian is re re, really, truly. In Yoruba, the R turns into D, L turns into D is Ododo, truth, fact, justice, equality, right, righteousness. You see this definition? You know, and so this is where we know that Ma'at is built off of. When we're talking about rightness, equality, truth, fact, things of that nature. This this root here, re re. And so we look into some other Bantu languages. <laughs> so we I made this chart, table eleven. So we have an Egyptian Middle Egyptian, re re, really, truly. Chiluba, Lelela, Lele Lele, Truth, Authentic, Veritable, Siswana Bantu, Ruri. Built just like in what we find here in Middle Egyptian. Truly. Same definitions, exact matches. Yoruba Ododo or Otito. Truth, fact, justice, equality. Now with the prefixes and suffixes, here's how you would pronounce it. So we have Ma, truth, justice, harmony, balance. We have Ma, le le la, truth, uh, reality, truth. Bu, le le la, reality, truth. Now they have, they don't use the, uh, this Chiluba example doesn't use the Bu or Ma prefix. They say Sia, but they add that K, C, that K suffix that is, that is here right now in this um, variant. So truth, reality. Bilingile. So they add another suffix. Bantu is nothing but prefixes and suffixes, you know, um, added to a monosyllabic root. Same thing what we find in ancient Egypt. Well, correctly, distinctly, carefully, right, rightly. So here goes Basa again. Malega, truth. Um, a variant, Nitik, truth. Zande doesn't have the prefix, so they just, the M prefix, so they just say Ringo, Truth, Somali, Rung, Truth, and there was a G here, but it got dropped, and so all that's left is this N. Truth, Kikongo, in Lungu. So what is the M prefix in Chiluba? Is N in Kikongo, which is its neighbor. So this is Maat, in Lungu, justification, the state of being just, justice, rightness, blameless, completeness. Lunga, be accurate, right, be exact, perfect. Isi Zulu, Lunga, become right, good. Utu Lunga, accuracy. So you can see that the Bantu has the archaic pronunciation. And so these folks are still in Central Africa where Negro Egyptian first started. And so when we go back up and we deal with these languages um, that we was dealing with earlier, just like what, uh, how should I say, with um, Brother Unk was saying earlier, you know, that we, we, in terms of the less diversity, you know, farther away from the point of origin. And so when we look at this, you see all kinds of falling off of phonemes, you know, the palatalization, you know, of the R sound. So the R, the nasalized of Vula trill is missing. So it turns into a glottal stop and things of this nature. So we know for a fact given directionality because you can't turn a glottal stop. If you see a glottal stop or an H sound, the next step is disappearance. So that's why in um, in Yoruba language they only say ma, true, to know. Ma. Because all those other phonemes are dropped in Yoruba. They no longer have those sounds. So we know Yoruba is younger than um, uh, Bantu. But Bantu preserves the old Negro Egyptian, you know, um, sounds. And so this is one of the reasons why we know that for a fact that it did not originate in, in um, Nigeria. And so there's some other linguistic ways that we can demonstrate this, but we can see that in the center that all of these concepts are still pronounced in the ancient way which was detected in Egyptian. And that it was not the other way around that these folks came and influenced any of these languages in Central Africa. It's the other way around. These folks from Central Africa, where Bantu is found, is is found in amongst these um, uh, in, in the Nile Valley itself. So this is one of the reasons why we're able to use, you know, um, Bantu languages to explain uh, phenomena in ancient Egypt. Um, and trying to find right now that Negro Egyptian chart, you know. And, and matter of fact, I'll just I'll say this one thing, and then I'm a, I'm gonna shut up and, and pass the mic. 
So I'm going back. Remember that you know on my program we had a um, conversation with Jean Claude Emboli, and he was kind enough to uh, share his what do you call it his his PowerPoint presentation in the form of a PDF. And so if you go to the video, you can download. Uh, I have a link here, which is this link, where you can download the um, this this PDF that I have here. And so you know you can at least get a rough outline of some of the nuances of Emboli's arguments, you know, um, in English if everybody doesn't read French. And so um, as I said again, you know, these things are acting funny because. My thing is acting slow, but here we got isoglosses. You know these these areas here preserve the the spellings. You know in um, in the green, but the reds they changed. You know over here, and you can see coming out here becoming Semitic, Hittite. You know Satam languages. We won't get into that, but what I wanted to show you was this. Um, if we can get to it. Um, Dang it, why do you have to, um... I think you're going to have to do a, a whole presentation on that question because that's like a key question in, in the ongoing arguments about trying to compare the genetic data and the migrations and who particular people are with linguistic uh, language families and, and the migrations, you know, in the cross-pollination of different languages, you know, convergence and the, and the separations. Now, uh, remember this part of the conversation that, um, you know, this is, this is another area that we know these concepts come out of, the, um, out of the Bantu and into ancient Egypt and from Egypt into Indo-European. And so, you know, people have never asked the question, why, when you're looking at these old European um, photos of kings, why is a throne important? Why do they have a scepter? And why are they wearing spots? These are concepts that were borrowed from the Africans, more specifically the ancient Egyptians. Any, any, you go into any of these areas in Indo-European or Semitic cultures, when it comes to kingship, these ideas are all borrowed from ancient Egypt. And you can see it in their motifs. But you can't explain this stuff, why all of these have to be part of the regalia of the king. But it makes perfect sense once you start getting into Negro Egyptian. Because remember what we talked about in terms of the Rabus principle? And then from the Rabus goes to, um, what do you call it? Um, the paronymy. And this is how they kept, you know, concepts alive. And so the only reason why, you know, the king sits on thrones is because the word for king sounds the same as the word for throne. Do you see it? So that's why you have the, uh, the king associated with a throne, because the words sound alike. So they felt that there was a relationship. And so there's the other variant of the word, you know, for chief. Is, we say heka, but it is, should be hekweri or hekwera, something like that. That same word is the same word for stick. So since the same word for chief is the same word for stick, this is where you get the scepter from. And you see this in Aquila the eagle, you know, in terms of uh, the sign and heru. You know, the heri is another word for chief. And Heru is a, what, another word uh, for falcon. That's why you have a Heru name. All of this is built on paronymy. And so you see these same associations. Remember, there's no leopards in ancient Egypt. So why are, are priests in ancient Egypt wearing leopard skins? Because they get these ideas out of Central Africa, where all these semantics associations are. So, you know, in Kemet, that uh, as Bilolo has, you know, um, demonstrated that T becomes a chi prefixed 
And so what is K is K, but this M sound, you know, uh, corresponds with Ingo in Congo. And so you see this word here, Ngolo, force. Force in, um, in, in Egyptian. All that matters is regular uh, sound correspondences. So where there's a B here or M, because B and M's change in, uh, in Egyptian, Ngolo. And then, you know, you have Mbolo, you know, here. Because that W turns into an O. Force. Ingo, leopard. Bal, leopard skin. Shango, priest. You know, again, back to the M. This would be an Ingo, but it's um, Mali, lion. But Sim, priest. We say Sim, priest, but the word Sim itself means priest. But it is Shango. A priest. And so all of these concepts that are still in their almost original form that make sense because the paranimi and the rapist in Central Africa, it doesn't make sense without knowing Bantu. And from, from Egypt, it influenced um, what we see in um, the concepts of kingship in um, Indo European. But they can't explain, you can't use Indo European because they have. These words are totally different. We have the word king and we have the word chair and thrones. These don't sound alike. The word chief and stick are different words. They don't sound alike. But because they sound alike in Negro Egyptian, that's why you see Ngolo force, Ngolo leopard, Shango priest. There's in Congo. In Congo is actually another word for God. And if you go in even in ancient Egypt, the word Kim is also a word for God. And so because these, these words sound alike, the ancient Africans felt that there was a relationship between these words. And so that's why all the chiefs and the kings wear all these regalia, because the words that sound, um, these words that sound alike, uh, there must be a relationship with them, just like what we see in ancient Egypt. So this is how we know that Egyptians psychologically cluster and linguistically cluster with people in Central Africa and Bantu that are closer to um, Negro Egyptian post-classic. So if you want to know how Negro Egyptian post-classic probably sounded, it will be closer, the Bantu was closest to it. Study a Bantu language. Yeah, I'm going to hold the... <laughs> I know that was a lot, but you know, as you said, it would take a whole um, hangout really just to deal with that question. You know, in, yeah. in a very systematic way. I mean, unless somebody else has something to say or ask, I I want to just show my uh, explain or give my observation of of what what I'm seeing and related to uh, a comedic phenomenon, because in the in the comedic um, cosmogony, cosmology text, you know, there's a creation story where creation happens by way of the tongue, you know, where, and it involves Pata, and Pata is the, is the tongue, or, you know, so to speak, where how creation comes out by way of uttering the utterances of words. So it seems like creation is really like a, a, a differentiation of, of this singular one substance. And it almost seems like the tongue aspect and speech and language operates the same way, at least how the ancient Africans kind of develop speech and, and develop words to describe reality. So it seems like these words are, um, are related, but then they branch off like tree branches and, and things where it's like one single substance, but then everything differentiates, even, even in the language itself. And I can kind of compare that to why we say metal nature is the communication of the divine or or the representation of reality in a communicative com, you know communicating reality so it almost seems to me it seems like speech develops the same way as creation does and and I think it gets into the ontology of how things are categorized and and, and, and so on and so forth you know described so and it seems like based on what you just demonstrated it seems like like how because of I, I'm saying I think this is um, 
intentionally or noted by the ancient Africans because when words sound alike, they group them together or they or they or they group them together because to you know to be able to form a, a verbal dictionary like a dictionary without it being a dictionary so to speak so it's almost like the the paronymy phenomenon would explain uh their 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 noticing of of how speech is related to creation itself and how things differentiate so you had hicca for a staff but then hicca for rulership and and how you how you showed how nisut is for king and then the soot is the actual thing for the chair or the thrones itself, so they kind of link it together to show out of this one substance, you know, things start to differentiate, but it's but it's kind of related. So that's just my observation, um, and it seems like it kind of goes hand in hand with one uh, one of the creation stories itself. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not saying <laughs> that that's uh, absolutely correct, but that's just my observation. Now either I got cut off or everybody's quiet. We we listening to you. Okay, hold up, sis. How you doing? Good. All right. God failed, brothers, brother. I know Issa's probably asleep. He's like five hours ahead. That would be so good if he was. <laughs> <laughs> I got off. Oh shit! He, Issa's not on here to piss everybody off. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's my that's my observation because um, you know, I mean, you know, I, I you know, we could probably kind of build on off of that another time. But it seems like that's what's happening with language and why language is associated with creation and the utterance of words and basically how how we label things. The, the the definition of the word definition means a to limit something so if if creation is all one substance differentiating into the into various things but it's all from one substance then a definition is simply setting up the boundaries to let you know how this is differs from this and and it's our perception of reality that causes us the ability to be able to do that and in order to communicate that, we have to set up a language that allows for us to do it. So it seems like language itself has this embedded phenomenon within it. And and I, I think we're seeing seeing this by these kind of demonstrations. So yeah. um, I'm sorry to leave you hanging, but um, I had the dog outside and it's barking up a storm, so I had to bring him in or bring her in to be exact. <laughs> um, but I, I caught most of it. Um, and let me see. Let me. I'm a, I think I'm gonna share from um, my Aluja book because this that's exactly something that um, that you know has been noticed. And so um, let me let me find it. See the the problem with writing so much is that you you forget where and where you you know you wrote something. Um. Yeah, man, I got I got notes. I got man, I had to sit sit up probably a week and just organize my hard drive. I got I got four terabytes. Uh. Four terabytes, fifty gigabytes of just pictures, random, just pictures. Uh, <laughs> no rhyme or reason to the names of the of the files themselves, but I gotta actually go through that stuff. Hold on. Um. Yes, Darn it. Um okay, myself. I'm trying to did I put this in the intro? I guess everybody else went to sleep. Or uh just hanging out on Unc got I'm surprised. It's like Friday night it's only eleven twenty two. Everybody can't hang. Yeah, man, the the, the work week then. Um Oh, uh, uh, uncle's like, nah, I'm here. I'm here. I I ain't going nowhere, man. That's what I do for a living, man. I study. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right here too. I, I got a uh, a, a, a party going on in the background. I'm gonna find it. 
You know, I was I'm, actually, I'm actually had, was at a wake, you know what I'm saying? Charged my family member got shot, man. So, you know what I mean? Uh, was, you know, yeah. I got to keep my mind going, bro. This is crazy, bro. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I want to reiterate my condolences, you know. That's, that's uh matter of fact, you know, us us talking about the papyri of Annie, papyrus of Annie, you know, kind of, um, goes yep. in what you what you what you're dealing with um yeah. with your family so yeah, it did but I, I tell you what uh whether y'all know it or not just the information and the work we do and putting on the subject matter to educate our people is a powerful powerful mechanism that would uh continue our people to learn that process of love you know what i'm saying because we ain't got no love for ourselves man and it's based off an of information that's been downloaded to us that we don't love ourselves. You know what I mean? You know, we came through the mechanism of hate, you know, the transcontinental slave trade. And so we have been dependent on those who hate us to educate us in, in matters of love. So I'm glad you wrote that book, Asar, because we really don't love ourselves, man. And so I'm here for this information because I do love myself and I do love my people. And I want them to have the same thing. So since I love myself, I'm not just going to go shoot a brother for no particular reason. I'm just not going to do it because I understand the value of human life. That's something we have lost. We've lost our humanity. Oh, uh, shame, brother. Yeah. And that's and that's one thing I was saying yesterday that we, you know, we got to get back into building character. We we have character building um, systems in place, and that was our our focus of of technology, as opposed to trying to focus our talents to build. Better things that become detrimental and and de and uh, uh, destructive on the planet, like bombs and and uh, killing and everything like that. We we actually build things that provided tools for us to build better people. Like you know, we looked at people as the actual goal of the technology to be, to become God on Earth, so to speak, to become divine. You know. And I know I saw I saw I said it earlier that the more you get into that and focus on that, the less you are focused on quote unquote worldly things. So it always it always gives the appearance that the spiritual people are poor and broke, you know, and have nothing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they got the wrong spirituality, yo. Yeah. But I'm saying we got we got to find we got to find the. We got to find the middle, especially in two, you know, in our day and age, we have to find the balancement of the two. And I think, you know, I think we're on our way to doing a good job. Most yeah. people get caught up on the information. Now, one thing that I would want to say is um, I'm going to say this and I'm going to jump into what I was looking for earlier. Then we could jump back um, is that we got to remember that, you know, and this is based on my studies and initiations, a human being is not a given. You are not born a human being. You are born a person. A human being is a title for somebody who has been initiated into what it means to be a human being. And what happens is is that, you know, we're our problem is that we judge, you know, people and communities who don't have initiations into what it means to be human you know by our human standards and so from a from a certain African perspective you know certain people aren't human beings they're not Muntu because they haven't gone through an initiation that tells them how to be and to show them how to respect life which is one of the um, primary reasons for uh, for our initiation systems and so um, you know we can get on that y'all can tell me your opinion but I just wanted to um, reiterate. Hold on, we gotta pause your um, mute your mic. All right, hold on, I can't make this. Okay, <laughs> he's got all the grandkids or something. Yeah, yeah, this week. yeah, all my kids. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Hey, hey, sorry, that's in your book. That little piece you just bring that's in your book. Which one? Well, this one that I'm reading right now is in Aluja. But the, the the stuff that I was reading before is is in, in the new book, the one that was just released. Oh, you talking about where's the love? When you talking about being initiated into the, the human family, that piece. And in, in many, I didn't go into that much detail on that aspect. That is actually going to be my focus on my religious proselytization as a form of violence book. 
And okay. so I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the difference between a person and a human being. A human being is something that you're initiated into, you know, which is why initiation was uh, so important, because you know uh, a, a a person can be born and go either way, you know, but you gotta you got they gotta go through a schooling process on how to be righteous, and so unless they have that and how to respect life, how to nurture and protect life, you know. Um, but I can, I can, I have another quote that is in "Where Is the Love" that hints on that, you know. But before then, uh, this is specifically for Brother Wujawu. Um, the quote that I was looking for was from Serge Sonaran in his book um, "The Priest of Ancient Egypt," and so he deals with we he the Egyptologists call punning, but you know um, uh, a linguist would call it paronymy. So the, the, the psychology behind that practice. And so uh, let me increase this just a little bit more. Let me say um, 180. Okay. 180. So hopefully y'all can read this. And so he says here that the Egyptians considered their language that corresponding to the hieroglyphs as a social tool. For them, it always... Re uh, what am I doing? Okay, it always remained a resonant echo of vital energy that had brought the universe to light, a cosmic force. So, meta nature has always been considered a vital energy that had brought the universe to light, a cosmic force. Thus, study of this language enabled them to explain the cosmos. It was wordplay punning or paronymy that served as a means of making these explanations in terms of the uh, the cosmos. How do we explain the cosmos and its interlocking you know, mechanisms? The moment one understands that words are intimately linked to the essences of the beings or objects they indicate, resemblances between words cannot be fortuitous. They express a natural relationship. A subtle connection that priestly erudition would have to define. This practice can seem childish in anything but serious, yet its logic emerges if we try to understand the value the Egyptians mm -hmm. placed on the pronunciation of words. You got to mute your mic, Unc. Hold on, let me mute your mic. Okay. Um. <laughs> and so any superficial resemblances between two words was understood as conveying a direct connection between the two entities invoked. So this goes into answering Brother Issa's earlier questions. It thus became a general practice employed in all periods of ancient Egyptian history and in all areas of inquiry and in priestly lore. It was the basic technique for explaining proper nouns essentially the very means of defining the nature of the deities. This was the case with Amun, the great patron of Thebes. We do not know just what the name meant, in terms of Amun, what they were referring to, but it was pronounced like another word meaning to be hidden. And the scribes played on this resemblance to define Amun as the great god who hid his real appearance from his children. The mere similarity of the two sound of the sounds of the two words was enough to arouse a suspicion on the part. Um, hold on. On the part of the. Where did it go? Oh hell! Oh my bad, because I got it. I got it doubled. Um, let me go back up. You can uh, keep it at that at that magnification. I um, <clears throat> I, I I can still see it. Well, I think everybody else can still see it. Um, no, but it's it's on two. So I had it. I actually had. You see the two pages. For mm -hmm. some reason, the PDF is is stuck on two pages. So I, I got to move over to the second page. I was thinking that it was. You know, vertical like most normal PDFs. Oh, gotcha. um, you get what I'm saying? So, okay. So, the priest that there was, 
So the connection is that there the to the priest that there was let me go back to that um where I was, Annie. Uh the priest that there was some close relationship between them. I'm talking about the mere similarity of the the sounds of the two words. That uh for the priest that there was some close relationship between them. And to find in it an explanation of God's name, thus addressing the primordial God as an invisible and hidden being, they invite him and exhort, calling him a moon, to show and reveal himself. And so, you know, this is understood, and I think his explanation is is very good to explain exactly, you know, what we were seeing here. That the the mere the mere similarity of the words invokes in the mind of the Negro Egyptian speaker that there's a relationship. And so this is a semantics that is unique to Negro Egyptian, that isn't in Semitic, that isn't in Indo-European, even though they can have the same words, which more than likely is either a borrowing or inherited and interpreted in a different fashion. So that's why chief and stick and why you see the kings rolling around with a staff. Just for the simple reason that the word for chief and the word for stick uh, sound exactly alike, you know, uh, or similar enough, and then that they they become emblems, they become um, related and associated with each other. Same thing with a throne. It's the only reason why a throne is associated with a king, because in early Negro Egyptian, the word for king and the word for thrones sound exactly alike. So same thing with these forces here. The reason why you see this Zulu um, chief, you know, with the leopard skin, um, and remember that a chief or a king is a high priest. So he's a priest. And he has the N'Golo, the force, you know, to rule. Uh, all of these words sound alike or similar enough that each a physical concept that could be associated with them becomes the motif for the priest and, and king. So you can't see, but here's some, some spottedness, the spotted eagle. And, of course, he got spots, you know, just like, you know, trying to imitate. He may not know it, but he's trying to imitate the um, uh, the leopard. And so um, this, is, this is how we know that the directionality... Is not from Indo-European. Is not from Semites into Africa. It's the other way around. Because you can only explain this by way of Africa. You can't explain it by way of Indo-European or Semitic. So that's a PDF, right? Well, that. Yeah, what you showing us? Yeah, um, that's just a that's just one of my early proof copies. I don't have my original PDF. Uh, oh, you talking about with this here? Yeah, this one here is a PDF. So if you go to uh, and I was thinking about the um, the Aluja book, but that, but this, um, yeah, I guess I could put it in chat. Um, hold on. Well, put it so in the, this the uh, Amara Squad group, the private group. Okay, well, I'm just gonna put it in the chat for you right now. But um, hey, so I got a qu uh, uh, just a quick question to ask, and um. Because because what you just said it it it, it kind of confirms what what I've observed just just my observation and studies kind of independently because I I haven't read that book that um, you quoted from and stuff and this is just something that I'm observing in the text and then in the story of the cosmology how how creation happens and unfolds itself but but the way it's kind of explained though I'm kind of have a little problem with it with it uh, mm -hmm. in terms of are are we are we are we faced with a question of like, did the chicken come? What came first, the chicken or the egg? Or <laughs> because what it sounds like is that the Egyptians stumbled across a word and they sounded like, and 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 bam, we're going to stick it together. Or does it does it seem like like this was actually kind of like scientifically, intentionally, you know, done this way when they when they start selecting these lexemes to represent. The, you know these objects or whatever, because it it sounds like it sounds like the way the the scholars are explaining it is okay. is, is is chance. It's accidental, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not accidental. It's it's it's. I would say it's a bit of both.
because again, the semantics is older. So remember that same semantics that we find in ancient Egypt is the same semantics that we find in Central Africa. So these associations were made early, but at the same time, even for new associations, you know, it, it's not it's not only an issue that the words have to sound alike. They also have to have some. They have to be conceptually similar, or they, it looks like they could go together in some way. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah, that's for, so, so for instance, the the stick that we saw. Remember that a chief or a king. The word for chief or a king is just a word for elder or father. And so, what do elders walk around with? Yeah, staff stick. Staffs and sticks. And so because the word sounds the same as the word for chief or elder, you know, um, we put those two motifs together. You know, and matter of fact, in I mentioned, let me find the book again, Abu Bakri Musalam um, earlier. And what we discover is that, you know, because you could argue at the same time that the word for stick was just simply a word for elder, and they just became um, differentiated over time. But you know, um, remember that other variant, the one, the one Heka, in 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 terms of that shepherd's uh, stick or staff. Mm -hmm. What we come to discover is that it's really not a word for stick. It's really simply a word for curve that like that particular like that particular staff has. And so I'm a um, I'm a Bakri Musalam. In this uh, in in this work in French, the Sahara or the Valley of the Nile, I'm translating from um, French. Um, he talks about this, and so he goes into the you know of course these West African languages, goes into the Dogon who have these same symbols and things of this nature, and of course the Fulani, which are pastoralists who uh, nomadic pastoralists who have these symbols and the same words. And so um, hold on one second, I want to show. I wish I had this on PDF. I would share it. You know, with y'all, um, but uh, as a matter of fact, I have this coming up. I, I translated part of this, or at least this table here, into English for my my new article that I'll be releasing uh, sometime in the near future. But you know, you see all these words, you know, for baton or sticks, and in ancient Egypt, that the Fulani have all of these words. Mm -hmm. You know, in in, in association um, <laughs> with with what we're saying here, and so we can go to the Fulani language because we see that every single <laughs> variant of, of of a word for stick or baton, the the Fulani got it. And so um, when you when you go into uh, just a few more pages, you know, into it, that's where he he's talking about the 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 uh, the scepter of authority. That's the name of this. Uh, this section here, and so it says the scepter, the authority, um, the, the scepter of authority. You know, and so all in here, he 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 breaks down uh, using the language that it's a it's a it's a word meaning curve, you know, or or hook or something to that nature, and um and so that's where it gets that name. So we know it's a totally different concept than the word for elder or chief, and so but what makes them come together? It's the issue of uh, semantics. Not semantics, uh, paronymy, and then of course uh, the the idea, the yeah, and the semantics. And so, of course, in West Africa, we see those staffs, you know, um, here. And mm -hmm. so, which one? I, I, I'm gonna I'm have y'all guess which one is the Egyptian staff. Oh, it'd be the one on the right. So, uh, so I don't know how it would come up. So let's start off. With, let's say this one. This is this to y'all left or y'all right that I'm pointing at? It's to our left. Okay, so this is one, two, three, four. So if you can guess which one is the Egyptian one. I'm not gonna guess because I don't want to spoil it. I'll let somebody else guess. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I know the answer and I'm not gonna say it because I don't want to spoil it. What what did he say? Hold on, what's that? Let me see if I can get that. Go ahead. Okay, which these are Egyptian staffs. Right. And so you know, it, it, it has uh, uh, well, in, uh, one of them's an Egyptian staff. Okay. Uh, 
staffs, and the other ones have come from basically West Africa. And so, which one? Which one is the Egyptian one? Oh, the thinner one. The thinner one. The which one? Oh, I'm counting from here. So this is one. Oh, hold on. Uh, yeah, one, two, three, four. I think I think either the one and the two. The one and the two. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's look. Right. Um. So yeah, the first one, the one, the number one was the the Egyptian one. Yeah. Um. The second one was the Fulani. And then the uh, the 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 third is actually a pair. The third pair okay. is uh, from um, Ghana. But you notice the one on Ghana though got the elaborate ampu. Yeah, that's or, uh, or jackal, you yep. know, head. Mhm. Mm that's crazy, yo. You that, know what that's, that's in one of your articles you wrote though. See, I'm up on that, son, son. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm just saying that you know this is one of the reasons why we we go to living traditions that still have these motifs. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but uh, I know we was trying to switch the conversation somewhere, and I probably took it somewhere left. Um, now you you covered definitely covered my my question. I you know I'm just I'm just filling in time, man. I I. I hate that um that awkward silence moment. So don't, don't let it be silent. I'll, I'll bring up another topic. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's that kind of confirms what I what I'm seeing. So yeah, I, I like to look into that. Um, matter of fact, I'll probably uh, bug you for the name of that book again because I need to get that. And because uh, I'm trying to articulate, trying to articulate it uh, at the same time. Like I, I I've been trying to articulate what I've been observing. And, and it's hard. So, so if somebody else has already done so, which I see, then I definitely want to check it out. Yeah, it's, it's we may have to coin a term for it. But again, I mean, well, fundamentally, it's again, it's paronymy. So again, like that, up until 2013, you know, even when I wrote that text, um, you know, before I got in Bowley's work, you know, because I already written Aluja. I actually wrote the first edition. Remember, I I had a free version of this. Um, that I gave away as a PDF, and so I didn't have um, in Boley's work then when I did this, and so I didn't I didn't use the word semantex, but that's fundamentally what it is. It's semantex. Yeah. You know? Um, and so let me let me see if I can find that dang. My thing was acting funny. Um. So man, we we cover. I mean, between the different hangouts today, though, we uh we covered. We covered um, hey, what did we cover? We covered the uh, oh, we covered the claims about the papyri of Annie and, and that fellatio stuff. <laughs> um, what did I miss? The Black Lotus. The Black Lotus Society. Yeah. Black Lotus Society, and then the uh, the the mischaracterization of Jonathan's argument. Uh, the fact that we can't read Metu Nature, and then the fact that we don't consult African languages, th that's pretty much, this this hangout is really busting that up. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, Uncle Keck, uh, earlier with the um, the claims, and then, you know, even Laron, even though he kind of uh, made the topic go off, but in, in that, you know, we had to explain explain that stuff, explain it away. So, yeah. Well, um, I mean, if we have no kind of got that understanding, that mindset, and and I think is is it has a lot to do with. I know y'all joke about comprehension level, but I but that's really not a joke, right? Yeah. Seriously, it's really not. And um, uh, the actual psychology of what we're dealing with here, because we can put it in straight in front of their face. But the psychology that they've been drawn through, the strain of racism, white supremacy, does not allow you to see the natural world because we they they got us so used to looking to the skies instead of looking to ourselves, instead of looking to nature, right? We're waiting for the sky to open up and something to jump out and say, "Yeah, here I is. Here you go. It's gonna change." We've gotten so used to that, but as we go back into African uh, tradition and customs, we can start to see how the world actually unfolded in this natural sense and later on uh, they call it science and so you know what I mean that's always been my goal to take people back 
to the natural world because that's where everything is happening. It's happening in the natural world. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's that psychology thing we're dealing with, though. We're dealing with a fractured people, a fractured psychology. And I'll tell you, um, um, I heard Professor James Small say it. I've, I've heard um, some other um, people say it, that a African spirituality is psychology. It's, it's, it's a major component of psychology. You know, the, the building of the mind, the building of, of character. Like, you know, every, people don't realize that just like our physical body got all these different organs and stuff like that, our, our so-called spiritual, quote-unquote, body has these organs that, that needs nurturing and cultivation, and that, and that is what psychology really is, you know. And, and, and cultures exit out. It exits out that psychology, and I think the Abrahamic traditions – the way they're practiced today, because I know Issa will try to argue up and down, but the way that the um, Abrahamic traditions are pushed and practiced today, it completely negates or neglects that aspect. So you got people who are not building their character, building uh, the character, and they're depending on, they're leaning on something else to be there to take up for the slack. So they call it Jesus, they call it God, they call it whatever, or their saviors. Where in Africa, you you actually become your own uh, savior, so to speak. Yep, that's why that's even in the book of the uh, the book of the dead, it says place your heart on the on the scale. Right. And um, because it's it's dealing with it's dealing with you judging yourself. Let your actions judge. And so you know it would be impossible. See, this is you know I was gonna go somewhere else, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna because I was gonna show you the per the people of the person. You know, in my book, but even still, like it's it's it it's erroneous to think that God is going to judge you. You know, for your actions, that is some kind of European, and that's a Semitic concept. That's not an African concept that God will judge you. Mm -hmm. You know, you judge you because the understanding is that you have free will, and so. You have to. This is something that I get into in the proselyt uh, the re uh, religious proselytization as a form of violence book. You have to understand that God put everything in place to let you know how things should be. It is your job to study what is what is available, and so in Africa, sin is more so an issue of ignorance. It's not something that you're born into. And, and with that said, if you understand the law, then you understand fundamentally God and what it, what it wants or what it does. And so, you know, if you understand that putting your hand in the fire will burn your hand, God's not going to judge you. You're going to judge yourself. When you put your hand in that fire... You told yourself that I want my hand to burn. <laughs> Everybody did that with you the iron. You judged eye. yourself. Everybody yeah. burned by the iron. You know, it, <laughs> when, when you know better, you're supposed to do better. And so that's why there was a, a strong emphasis on knowledge in ancient Egypt. So that you, you, you could know better, you could know the consequences for your actions. Because the consequences of your actions are already built into the universe. That's why it's, it's, it's your, you're putting your judgment <laughs> on the balance. You're you know, putting your action. Go ahead. And I was going to say that that's reflected in the um, imagery in the prayer in Heru when you are led, like your, your heart, which is not really your heart, it's your conscious or your mind, your intellect, the seat of intellect, that is weighed against the, 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 um, the rule of God, which would be my, and then after that, if you pass that wane, then you're basically led to Usir, and Usir actually represents, which is one reason why you're why you're called Usir, is is the ultimate you. Like Usir becomes the ultimate you, judging yourself or accepting yourself. You know, um, and that's why you're you're mummified like Usir. You're 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 going through. Matter of fact, this is what we w we didn't go into earlier, was that the two ladies that are standing at at both ends of your casket and mummy 
is Isis and Nebet Nebethet, and they're reenacting the story of the resurrection of Usir. Yeah. So you, actually, you actually are Usir in that instance. You know, so all throughout the text, you're Usir, and you're judging yourself. You know exactly. And so it's 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 you know it's deeper than what you know these these people who don't read the text and got a semblance of African culture, you know, could possibly comprehend. And you know, what do you mean you judge yourself? Again, this will go back into the if if God judged you, that means God could change his mind. You know, you notice that in the um in in the biblical text, God changes his mind a lot. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and for him to be the supreme being and all knowing, you know, it's not like in ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt, Ra changes his mind. You know, after he sent Sekhmet, you know, to destroy mankind, he changes his mind about it, and and he does something to save humanity. But Ra is not the supreme being. Mm. And Ra, is, it's never claimed that Ra is omnipotent, you know, omniscient, mm. nothing to this nature. He can't. You know, Ra's a totally different character. He can't be, especially when when he grows old and tired and gets and gets his secret name taken and get poisoned and and all this and that. Exactly. You, you can't. You know? And so, uh, so it's not an issue. You know, God doesn't judge you. You never hear about the nun judging anybody. You you rarely hear about the nun. You know, the nun pops in, does his creation, then it's gone. That's that's typically how it is in Africa. God does his thing, and then he's gone. Well, how does this tie into the typically what we call the judgment scene in the uh, halls of my house? Yeah, Again, that's it's, this is because if you understand African culture, all the deities are just aspects of yourself. And then that's why, um, like, I have a video of... Um, uh, Dr. Theofala Wabinga talking about this. Um, the, if you if you have a if you see a video of Dr. Theofala Wabinga talking about meta nature writing, mm -hmm. you know, I uploaded that video, and he he talks about you know here in the um, and we should you know go through this and actually you know decipher this this scene like we should just do this whole scene this this whole judgment scene that we see here where it talks about that you weigh you put your heart. It doesn't, um, you put your heart on the balance. You weigh yourself, you judge yourself. You know, and so your actions, if you understand the consequence of your actions, you're judging yourself. And, and it's, it's not that hard to, uh, to, to fathom just you know, on a regular mundane basis. You, you know what's funny? You know what's funny as all? That a lot of people don't understand why you judge yourself. And it's very, very simple. <laughs> and you ain't got to read Metanetra. But watch this. You judge yourself because you're the only one with yourself at all times. You're the only one that truly knows yourself. And you're the only one because you can't lie to yourself. Mm -hmm. Think about that. <laughs> hey, you know what, though? That that um, is surprising. That is actually reflected in the Bible, too. Like your, your what does it say? Your, your, your hands and your feet are going to testify or something mm -hmm. um, somewhere mm -hmm. in there. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know your your limbs. That's in the prayer head root as well. Your your limbs are gonna speak and different things. But that's key to know that the natural are aspects of yourself, and they kind of coincide. Same thing with Yeah, it's they the same coincide. Thing. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was gonna say uh, you you had shown a picture before where where the bull, where different parts of the bull are associated with different social aspects of the of the society and community. But uh -huh. the natural natural also associated with different organs of your um, so-called spiritual body, where like I think you called it the people, of, the the persons of people or something. I'm just, just going to share it right now. Yeah, but keep talking. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was going to say that that you know oh. the judgments, the laws, because the natural also become laws. Like if you if you simplify. If you simplify existence down to its common denominator, you know you can you can you can see how things are related, how how interrelatedness and inter interconnectedness can be linked to the word love or the concept of love because to love something you have to see something else as yourself. So you see this 
is connection and things. So if you kind of narrow it, huh? Oh, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's why I'm like the word love is the root of the word ma'at. And, and when you get into reciprocity, like I have a whole section in this book on reciprocity, that there's no love without reciprocity. Reciprocity is central when you're talking about a relationship between entities or beings um, mm -hmm. in general. You know, it's reciprocity. You know, I, I do for you, you do for me. And so that's exactly what we see here, even in the book of Ani. You know, but um, even here, like in this section of, the, of my book, I'm talking about you know, I go and do what we did earlier and explain the ba being the mind, you know, the heart uh, and soul and life of a person and um, and the genius in, in the word I have bolded here, genius. And then I go into the definition of the word genius. People don't know this about the word genius. The word genius means tutelary God, mm -hmm. classical or pagan, from genius, guardian, deity, or spirit, which watches over each person from birth. Spirit incarnation, wit, talent, or, or prophetic skill, originally a generative power. And so um, in that aspect, I have a footnote, footnote two for this chapter. My bad, footnote three. No, 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 footnote two. Um, where I talk about this aspect of describing the self, because the Ba, which we have here, is part of the self. In African traditions, let me see, let me increase this a bit more. Can y'all see this better? Um, here we go. Uh, yeah, this aspect of describing the self in African traditions is where one will find much diversity. What we discuss here is a basic summary based on the, the consensus of what we find as it regards the definition of the self across the continent of Africa. Kamalu, 1998, pages 51 through 75, has a chapter called The Person as Multiple Cells that is instructive for our discourse. His summary of the collective African attributes of the self breaks down the, the person into the destiny self, the spirit double, the transcendent self, the soul, breath, life force, the thinking and feeling self, the heart, the ancestral reincarnated self, the ancestral guardian, and the dream self, the shadow. Now, Amadao... Amadou, Hapatiba, in his Aspects of African Civilization, Person, Culture, and Religion, 1972, Chapter 1, uh, the notes of the notion of the person informs us, informs us that the person in the African context is not a singular static being. Instead of a speaking of a person in the singular, the Bambara and Fulani, for example, speak of the people of the person. The body is simply the person receptacle, which houses the multiple persons which make up the person. So for our own discussion here, what we call mind in the West is a separate spirit or being, just one of the many people of the person. And, you know, go back here. This is in correlation by dealing with the mind. It's a totally different aspect of the self. It's one of the people of the person. And so I don't know how many of you will admit this, but <laughs> this is where I think they got this from. Now, for instance, have y'all ever been reading? Now, you know when you close your, your mouth and you don't speak and you think to yourself that there's a voice in your head, correct? Yep. Yep. Okay, you, you more than likely it sounds like your voice, but it's a voice nonetheless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, have you ever been reading and you're reading in your mind, and of course that voice is talking, but then another voice comes in and starts talking and thinking about something else? No. Have you ever done that? No, we're going to take you to the hospital, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, when when like if you're reading over something and your mind drifts while you're reading, mm -hmm. it's another voice in your head. It's at least two voices that you hear. And here's <laughs> another thing that you gotta consider. That's here's just... another thing that you gotta consider. <laughs> Y'all just don't want to admit it. Just That's like when true. Sanjetti asked about the masturbation, you know, uh, at the other conversation. Like all the brothers were solid. 
uh, <laughs> the um, uh, who was I getting at? Um, the two, the third, the two voices. Uh, besides the two voices, okay. Now this is another thing that always pondered me. Now you know the only reason why we can hear out here in this world is because some sound travels and tingles your eardrum. That eardrum, you know, translates into electrical symbols, which comes into our brain, and we and the brain interprets it as sound and whatever phenomena. Now mm-hmm. the question is, since that is a physical concept or a, a physical reality, without the vibration of sound, you cannot hear. What are we hearing? What mechanisms are being used to hear the voice in our head when we read or think to ourselves? Since there's no ears in your brain. And it's not coming from, the sound is not coming from somewhere else where we hear it in our ears. Or maybe we do hear it in our ears. So then the question would be, well, where, where's the direction, you know, of that sound coming from? You know, it's stuff like this when you ponder on it that, you know, leads to other types of, you know, conceptualizations and theories. And this is what we find in ancient Egypt or just Africa in general. That is multiplicities of the self. And so all of these deities, I know this for a fact, and in, in, especially in Ifa. So, you know, like my head is is Eshu and my compliment, my mother is o, Oshun. So for those who know and understand what that means, I'm Eshu Oshun. But that doesn't mean I'm Eshu Oshun because I'm made up of all the Orishas. These are just the dominating energies that we use to kind of classify like we would, you know, or you were born in July, so you were Leo, you know, at the end of the month or something like that, you know. And so um, these aspects, you know, the Osar, Osiris, you know, Aset, Nebethet, these are all aspects of the self. So what you're seeing in these, um, in a lot of these stories outside of the funeral possessions is just situations or internal, a lot of them are just internal battles that, um, that go on inside ourselves. You know, and these are different aspects of ourself. Our inner set, you know, battling with our inner Heru. And matter of fact, this is actually in the Bible as well, too. And so there's a professor, I forgot his name, I met him in Atlanta when I went to the Nile Valley 2 conference. And he's a, he's a, he's a good brother, um, well-versed in Hebrew, well-versed in Syriac, you know, uh, Greek. Uh, he's a biblical scholar, but he's also kind of African-centered. Um, but he has, I'll share it in the, in the, in the, um, the uh, Amara Squad group, uh, the, his lecture that, that he has online. And he talks about this. Like when you actually go through the words in original Hebrew and these certain stories, this is how we know they're myths. You know, serious scholars of the Bible know that these are myths. But it's the layman, the people who ain't serious about the scholarship, who try yeah. to argue that this stuff is real. But, you know, he breaks down and he's a PhD in this stuff. So this is what he does all day. That you know, the, the the particular story he was talking about all happened in his head. You know, um, and you're just watching the, the different aspects of himself being played out, you know, in his head as he's meditating or in trance. And, it, and it's obvious the way that it's not like one of those things where it's like, well, you know, it could or could not be. Like, when you actually go through it, it's like, damn, you know, because you had the English version, you don't have these Hebrew words. It doesn't make sense, but that's just the that's just the the method of the day. That's what the ancients did. So that's why you know you become an Osiris. You don't become you know somebody else's Osiris. You are Osiris. That's your higher self. I want to say too. I, I know that um I I always say this. I say this. Man, I've been saying this for years. That I, I think that uh, Raul and the Fear Amen is is one of the most uh, misunderstood, uh, you know, persons who who are, who are providing information, you know, through his series of books and stuff like that. And you know, I always encourage people to get him and read read his whole series and not just you know volume one or whatever. 
But everything that we just mentioned right now, it, uh, he explains. He he talks about it in, in all throughout his his works, and it's almost his, his works are actually dependent upon that entire concept. Like mm -hmm. I don't know if you see uh, this whole tree of life thing that people say is the Kabbalah tree of life or whatever. Um, he doesn't treat it like how the Kabbalists do or whatever. It, it looks similar, but he actually shows the different spheres. The different spheres represents the different aspects of the self. Or at, you know, and if you hear Osir um, set members, they always refer to themselves as my person or either myself and stuff like that because they understand the concept of the of the of the different um, makeup of the spirit. So like to your question, the, the voice the voice in the head in here he identifies that with sphere number eight which will be the sphere of what's called sab, and, and the word sab goes into, into judge, it goes into the word uh, sabit, which means to instruct, to be a student of, or whatever, and in here, I don't have a PDF or anything, that's what I'm showing, but right here, he, he discusses, I'm, I'm acting like y'all can read it, but in here, he discusses how the, what we call in thoughts, uh, how it gains clothing, like he 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 metaphorized it like it gains clothing, and by by be gaining clothing, this is our ability to clothe our thoughts, and this is how we're hearing it inside of our head. I mean, you know, it kind of gets a little deep, and I don't want to get long-winded with it, and I I don't have anything to share, but but he actually talks about a lot of that stuff, a lot of that stuff. All the different netru are are dealing with different aspects of the spirit, and he goes into how like why why do we think in imagery? And why do we think verbally, like the verbal clothing of our thoughts, and then there's the imagery or the pictorial clothing of our thoughts. And these are two separate components of the spirit that he identifies as far as the imagery with Het Heru, and then the verbal clothing with um, Wap Wawet and Anpu um, because, of, because of the sounds and how we clothing, clothe sounds and stuff like that. So... I just thought that was real interesting, I, and I, I'm telling you, I, I think he's the most, one of the most misunderstood people in the, um, in a certain, you know, in certain circles and stuff like that. So, I dig him. Um, it's, it's just that you know he fooled everybody with that meta nature. Oh know, yeah, people, yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's yeah, people, that's, See, that's, that's what's disappointing to people. They're thinking they're learning the language, and it's a totally different concept. But I will say this, but. But nah, Ra'u Nefer, Ra regardless, is in alignment with true Meta Nature is. That's what I was just going to say. Because <laughs> Meta Nature, see, divination. people don't understand this. Meta Nature comes from divination. Yep. And Meta Nature is actually the cognate to Odu Ifa. Now, um,. I'm saving that, the breakdown for that, you know, for the other publication that I'm dealing with on religious proselytization, because I argue that Ifa is the oldest um, religious system that we can define in Africa, and that the Yoruba have one variation of Ifa, but that the ancient Egyptians had another. And so there's an actual, um, and you've been to one of my lectures where I talk about this, where... Um, the brother out of Cameroon who recently got his PhD uh, in Egyptology. He did his whole dissertation on the Metternetra script and how it derives from um, oracles. And this is why we call it God's words. It's no, it's, it's no different than in um, Odu Ifa. Ifa is a god. But um, the word Ifa is cognate with the word Keper. Kepper is a more fuller way of saying Ifa. And um, and so Odu is just oracular utterances. And it's it's cognate with the word mo with medu. It just doesn't have the M prefix. So the M prefix is a prefix of abstraction. You know, the word is do, which actually comes from R. And we know this because the same word exists in Chiluba. We say Ila. But when we, we add the M prefix of abstraction, it becomes Malu. Or uh, Madu, Mundu, different um, because the uh, the nasalization of the D. Or um, you can get a D from putting an I behind L. So I, I, 
uh, if you say Li, it'll turn into D. But anyway, um, Odu Ifa is the same as Medu Necher. And so when Ra'u Nefer brings, you know, the oracle system to Medu Necher, you know, he's keeping in alignment from its original origins. Yeah. And that's and that's why that's why I think people are sleeping on and 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 I think one of the errors one error one of the contributing factors of the of how he's mischaracterized is because he didn't make that clear at first. Now he does it though because yeah. I've, I've actually heard him, I've actually heard him explain that you know that Medu Necher is not to study the language as far as his first book in 1992 or whatever, uh, but he has a series and then you know so now he's explaining that hey. This is a divination system, and he attributed it to Jehuti because Jehuti is the Lord of the divine words, and Jehuti, in, in that in that respects, would correspond to Arunmila as far as um, the aspect, you know, of of being in charge of the oracles and um, divinations and things. So, so yeah, he 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 actually created a binary system. He actually combined the. Um, the netchers with the different suits, like like for the curry shells, when you have the one up, one down, or whatever, you actually combine them in the cards. Like I, you know, I got the cards. I, uh, I don't know if y'all ever saw them, but um, why y'all keep I talking? I'm gonna show you. Card. That's why I was throwing off at first, cause I just bought the book, didn't know there was cards that went with them. Back in the early days, um, I'm trying to pull up right now. One of my lectures, so I can show y'all the individual. Uh, hopefully, I got it in here. Look, let me show you. Let me show you um, just an example. Okay, I don't know if you can see this, but this is this is the um, Heru card. Heru card, and if you notice that it has four uh, circles here, and the four circles represent suits. So if if you have one dot, it will mean one thing. Two dots would be another. Three would mean another, and four would be different ones. So there's cards that rep. There's, this card has only one dot, and it's a, the same card that has two. Another card has three, and so on and so forth. So when you're doing your divination, you're reading. Not only does it tell you the nature in charge of the of the situation, but it gives you the the more detailed specific answer. And how to, how it's responding, so you can, can narrow down the interpretation and, and so on. So it's, it's similar to the curry shells being uh, thrown or cast. So I'm telling you, I, I think it's a brilliant system, and it works. I mean, people swear by it. I mean, I I I use it. I've used it, and you know, it's um, it's it's good go for me. You know, I think people sleeping on it. But anyway, I'm trying to find this. Uh, See, oh, I hate this. Uh, talk to Google about it being so resource intensive for this hangout. Um, it is messing up. So, the question. Yeah, were your last words, Ujahu, still concerning Raul Neframa's work? Oh yeah, I was saying, I was saying, I was showing the car. You see the car I showed? Yeah, but I wasn't looking at my phone while it was off to the side while I was doing some other things. But uh, yeah, I, I agree that he has some valuable stuff. But like, I never got over the fact. But like, I never got over the was because I was looking to study metal nature, and I didn't figure out that he was not gonna start talking about that until I almost finished the first one. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what we were talking. Yeah, that's that's what we were talking about, and and see now now he he definitely makes that clear. I, I've 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 been to a couple of his lectures, and he made that clear. He he you know he explains the difference. But I think when it first came out, uh, people no actually actually it's like a retro thing because when the book first came out, nobody was really dealing with Nerd and anyway, so it didn't matter. It it was just accepted as is. It's it's just now that people. Get wind of it, and they want to learn metal nature, and you see it on the shelf. You're like, "Oh, bet I'm gonna learn metal nature." And when you get it, then you get disappointed because you people are trying to learn the language. So he, so he, he had to kind of go backwards and re-explain, uh, re-explain it, you know, in the sense of when he first came out, uh, because it's really a divination system. Damn so. nice. You know, I'm gonna tell you what John Henry Clark said. He said that shit was guesswork. <laughs> 
Yeah, but um, but the thing is that Raul Nefer is actually initiated into um, EFA system, and so he's very familiar with, you know, um, divination uh -huh. and and how it's supposed to work. And so you know you don't have to uh, you know you don't have to wait on dead ancestors to create a divination system. You just have to understand how it works. All that matters is you coming into agreement with the tool that you're using. And you agree on what what the what the uh, forms mean, mm -hmm. and then that you make a covenant with the spirit world, and then you on um, to do your business. And so, um, but even before that, I want to. Uh, this is what I was uh, talking about earlier, in terms of. Can y'all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this is Dr. Emmanuel B. Tong, uh, from Cameroon. Um, he's an Egyptologist now. And so uh, this is Noman Digi. When I talk about Omen Digi, this is him right here, Egyptologist and linguist out of Cameroon, you know, uh, one of those top African center scholars. If I can get him on my show, it's a wrap. Um, <laughs> but um, this is Emmanuel Bitton, Um and this is, he's holding here a copy of his Ph.D. dissertation. And so this is Karen Excel out of uh, London, you know, I forgot what museum she's at. Uh, she's one of the uh, curators or former curators um, at the, uh, one of the Egyptian museums. And so uh, this is from my presentation, a slideshow on Kepper. Uh, let me go back. Um, the thesis uh, is an attempt to define the emergence and development of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic writing in an African context, specifically comparing the development of writing and its use to that of the Basa and Cameroon. Specifically, the thesis focuses on the development of hieroglyphs as a semiotic script that acts as an interpreter for divine words accessed in dreams and divination, oracular ceremonies. From this early usage, the signs were later used to write the everyday language, but retained within their form a semiotic function, in particular in relation to the determinatives, which are not an element of phonetic languages. Central to the thesis is the idea that language emerged as a sacred form of communication and not as a way of organizing the administration as has often been argued for early language development in, uh, in ancient Egypt. And so I go into the word and how the word medu becomes the word for myth. So when you say myth, you're saying the word medu. And we can break that down. I don't think I have anything directly... Um, well, I was just saying that the word Odu, you know, is, is oracular utterances, oracular utterances, because that's what a myth is. See, this, see, this is what we're missing in the ancient Egyptian um, records, because the myths in, in Greece and the Odus in, in Yoruba land, all the same words, they're associated with certain signs, certain divination signs. So you would do a divination and then there will be a story or a myth that goes along with the divination. And this is the behind all the stories that you see in ancient Egypt, but we don't know which signs or which kind of what their oracle system look like. That's a priestly secret. But, you know, we get a glimpse of that concept in um, Odu Eva. So Odu, again, is oracular utterances. That's what all these are. And so I, I, I interpret Medu as oracular utterances, knowing uh, for a fact that, you know, um, the, the, the scientific way um, that we've approached this, and then, of course, with the, uh, the, other, um, the, the other words and stuff that we can demonstrate uh, scientifically. And so, like, people don't know that, um, like, for instance, uh, Greece uh, and the Ephi Corpus of Delphi. At Delphi, the priestess of the god uttered, in a divine ecstasy, incoherent words in reply to the questions of the suppliants. These words were interpreted by a priest in the form of verses. The Delphic Oracle was primarily concerned with questions of religion. In more worldly matters, its, pronounce, its pronouncements were often obscure and equivocal, capable of being interpreted in accordance with the event. And so for anybody who knows about... Um, the uh, Yoruba divination system. This is what the Babalawo uses, which is no Pele chain. And um, in Hebrew, you have the hip uh, PL word for cast, um, the fall, 
Same. You, you notice the same roots? P L, P L, P L. You see the same thing. So when we get to Greek, Apollo, and even in English, pole. You know, comes from the same root. But this is where you get the word kepper from. Um, but let me go past here. Uh, because I wanted to show Apollo. Well, I, I think I just discussed Apollo. Um, you know, there. No, so I, I'm probably went too far. Uh, I did with Buddha. What's this from? Know. What's that from? Sorry? You know about Apollo. So, what you know about that, son? No, I'm I'm trying to find in here because um, it, it actually it uh, there's a citation that actually tells you that Apollo is a god of divination. Remember yep. that the word. Remember I said that the word Epha is the yep. word Kepper, and uh -huh. you know because this is from my larger presentation. So I'm not trying to go through my presentation here. What I was what I was trying to find my slide that lets you know, like like for instance here that the word R word mouth speech rue utterances Yoruba oro word mouth speech oro roar ede language. So you see how the R becomes D. So they don't say mede. Mm -hmm. What's the word for a uh, language in Egyptian? Yeah, you have. Uh, well, they use they use uh, row. No. But even still, even that or medjet. Yeah, they have um, uh, jet or something with a D or medit medu. But not with the do with the with the um, the W sound like we see here, but with the dot T. It's, it's the so-called feminine form. And so again, you have the same word here in Yoruba, but again, they don't have the M prefix. Shiluba helps to explain all of this again. So you have Ela, utterance, command, word, Diyi, speech, command, divine law. Another variation from Ra, Wur, Arubu, Bualu, word, history, science. So when I deal with Medu, which is you know, various ways you can say it in Shiluba, Bualu, Maru, Madu, Malu. It's a word for word. History and science. So when you're talking about Medu Nature, you're talking about the science of actually Medu Nature is like the science of bringing things into being. But that's another part of the lecture um, that I won't uh, get into. So here we go uh, with these different variations. You know, um, Med in, in Fulani to speak, to say, words, utterances. Um, you know, here's the Odus that I talked about earlier. So I'm kind of going backwards now. You know, but I, I wanted to show, huh? Now I'll say that screen right there. Uh, that's that's kind of get what I was talking about the 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 circles, the uh, the on and off aspect of the the circles on the divination cards. Yep, and this is this represents all light and all darkness, ones and twos. Excuse me, zeros and one. No, ones and zeros. This will be zero. This will be one in computer language. And not a, not only that, this is this is how this is how real it gets. Hold on, let me see if I if I got it on here. Um, please tell me that I got it on here. Oh, I don't have it on there. Um, let me see if I got it in the on the thumbnails. If I can look through the thumbnails, uh, because in in modern science. They, they they deal with this in terms of the universe. Um, and here's where I was, I, was, I was looking for earlier. You know, um, Apollo, when I talk about Kepper and Apollo, Apollo, the son of Zeus, and Leto, the twin brother of Artemis. Apollo was the god of music, principally the Lyrae, and he directed the choir and muses, and also of prophecy. And this is, and the divination tool that they use was the arrow. So you would shoot the arrow in a way and they would interpret how the arrow flew. And this is important because the word ifa has to deal with um, birds, the flight of birds. And the same root that became for the flight of birds became the word for arrows. And so, you know, we're getting into how old ifa is. Um, see, I don't have it. And, you know, that's my little bird symbols here. So you have off augury to practice augury. Dealing with birds, Afa, Fa, Pa, Peru, motion, going out, you know, all of these are oracle stuff. 
but um, no, I don't have it in this lecture. I didn't put it in this one. But it's it's a it's a professor, Professor Gates, you know, who's been doing um, some work, you know, in theoretical physics, and the way that he maps, he talks about basically he's not using the language, but he's talking about how the universe is made of old dudes. And he even he even um, he say he says it in computer language that it's ones and zeros, and and the way that he maps it, it looked just like a single leg of Odu in the Yoruba Ifa system. But he calls him a dinkerous. He don't he don't call him Odu like I would call him Odu. Mm. But um, but yeah, I just wanted to share that um, that um, that brother, Doctor Emmanuel um, Bitong. Yeah, that's uh, that's some that's some good. See, that's a that's the kind of stuff, man. We gotta we gotta get into it. <laughs> See how you can't get into that kind of discussion with Hebrew Israelites. Nah, that's never. That's beyond them. That's beyond them. That's not true. But yes, it is. We got a Hebrew on the line. <laughs> <laughs> we got a Hebrew on the line right there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. Because matter of fact, E5 is in the Bible. <laughs> But it's it's a it's a it's called ob. They say ob instead of uh, ifa. They say ob, and the, and the people in, in if you look in the in the dictionaries, they'll say necromancy. But that's you know, that's just their way of saying the divination because you you the the, div the divinations are also used to um to consult with your ancestors, mm -hmm. and so that's why they call it necromancy. And so I forgot who the who the the king was, but he got ostracized, and he was having these bad dreams and stuff like this. So you know he conjured up Saul, you know, and he had he went to an Oba woman and mm -hmm. conjured up Saul, and you know she was a she was afraid at first because, um, you know they were going around killing people who was practicing Ephi. Right. In in the Bible, so she was like, no, you know, I don't want to, you know, because you'll surely have my head, you know. But they practice it. It was just that underground, just like what you find in uh, Africa today. All them Christians, all them Muslims in Africa, be all so holy rolling in the church, be secretly going to Babalawos. Any Babalawo will tell you this, you know, to get information on how to move forward. I'm around Ifa every day, like out here, like. I'm with the National Black United Front, and they all, they all with Efi. So, yeah, Houston's a good Efi has, uh, you know, a good Efi community. Yeah. Uh, so they have several different Elays, you know, there. Um, you got them heavy yeah. down here in in, uh, in Georgia and in Atlanta area, you know. Uh huh. Um, got you, you know, heavy, 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 and 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 just to speak again on um the Osea Set Society. A lot of it. A lot of the members are also initiates into uh, Ifa system because a lot of them wear the Eleke beads and and everything and go to different Ilays. Yeah, I help organize the caravan to the ancestors every year, and that's like this huge event. Everybody's Ifa, and they they come <laughs> out and you know they be praying to the ancestors or whatever. So, do you have any? Because uh, I've been trying to talk to Oba. Uh, what's his name? Um, Oh, how I forget his name that fast. Um, short brother. Um, not not the light skinned brother. You know who I'm talking about. In 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 buff. You talking about Bobby Yawo? No 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 no. He's not he's not a priest or nothing like that. Um, and and, and I don't want to describe him this way. You know, but he you know he's an older gentleman, short, you know, kind of hey, you know you bug know. eyes. Huh? Bobby Yawo. Um, that's yeah. He's been yeah. That is Bobby Yawo. He's short, real short, like and round. Right? Yeah, I don't know about that name. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, I've been trying to get him to. I can I can get his number for you. I mean, I I, I have. He's he's a friend of mine on Facebook. I, I don't know why his name escapes me now. It's like he's. I speak about him so much. He's originally you know? from Chicago. See, I don't know if he's originally from Chicago. That I don't know. But ever since I've known him, he's all been been about Houston. And so, uh, dang it, dang it. Um, he's like it, it really, just, really, really short, though, right? And he has a you know kind of a face that 
See, I'm not. I'm, just, just say you're not being offensive. Not truth, man. I'm just no, because it's a way that you like. If I say it, you know, then you're like, oh, okay, you know. But he's kind of, you know. Um, but anyway, if you know who I'm talking about, you know. Uh, I'm him, not but, sure. Just say it, like. I, I, but I don't. I don't. Never mind. I, I, if, if it comes up, you know. Uh, if it's it, 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 it pop up in my head when I'm thinking about something else, so if we talk about ice cream or something, then it'll just pop up in my head later on in the discussion. But, um, you know, I've been trying to talk to them about diversifying the caravan. Mm-hmm. Like, if, if I was in charge of the caravan, I would have it to where every year, I've even spoken, I was one of the um, um, speakers at the caravan one year, mm-hmm. um, I would do something like that we highlight a different culture, you know, um, you know, of Africa, a different place of Africa, and then a culture from that place in Africa you know, in terms of one of the modern states. And the reason being is because it's so Yoruba centric. Yeah. And there's so many there's so many there's so many other traditions there and, and it that that you know I mean I'm a uh, uh, I'm an Ifa, so I mean, you know, I love my Ifa. But you know, for it to be a, a pan African thing, I feel, this is my opinion, that, you know, some other groups should be represented. So even if you know, because it's a large EFI community, you know, in, in, in Texas, Louisiana, you know, because, you know, they come from, you know, all over, um, that still that, that other communities from the African uh, continent should be represented, and at least in the common theme. So, like, at least you have a speaker come talk about their, their people, their customs, and things of this nature, and introduce some new ideas, and, and not have it be so EFI-centric. No, that is a good idea because that, I mean, I, I agree. I've I've brought that to their attention for different, like, but not pertaining mm-hmm. to the, the caravan, but just in mm-hmm. general because it seems like that's all, all we talk about is even, not not knocking it, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, because I actually really enjoy learning about E5, but I know there is so much more. And, but, yeah, you're right. That would be good. I think that would draw more people, even though we get hundreds of people that come out, but I think that would that would even attract more people, though. Especially more people here, you know. Yeah, because, I mean, you have a Ghanaian community there. Mm-hmm. You have an Igbo community there. You oh, know, we, e- you, Igbo, uh, the, the, B, the, the, the BIA system, but, you know, most of these facts, people are going to be Christian, so it's going to be hard trying to find someone indigenous um, <laughs> that, that speak on it, but you have a large community. <laughs> I'm sorry? I was saying, especially the Igbos, they don't, they yeah. really... Out here, they really don't deal with the uh, the traditional system at all. I have yet to meet one. They're hardcore <laughs> white <Christian>. Jeep lovers. <laughs> we had to we had to school uh, Uncle Keck on the on the divination system, boy, because Uncle Keck is a, a tough tough cookie to uh, talk about the divination, boy. <laughs> you ain't got to school me hey. shit. Come on, yo, you ain't got to school me on that at all. Hey. Hey, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I put it, I put it, I'm going to put it no, to you I'll, like this. I don't mean to school you, I mean, you know, I'm saying convince you of its, of its effectiveness, of its effectiveness. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, this, it's, it's, with everything that you talk about in Eve, I'm surprised I don't have, I must have a different version, because this would have been the perfect place for me to put this here, in terms of the, um, I'm going to find it, y'all can continue talking, I'm going to be quiet, let me mute myself. I'm gonna find this. I'm gonna show it to you. Hey, Wu Jia, keep trying, yo. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like the fact you can get a deviation and say don't come on a goddamn show. That's a bunch of crap to me, yo. No, no. See, that's yeah. See, don't. Sure, don't no, nah, but see, don't don't let don't let people's uh, misuse of it, um, you know, represent it. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's like that's that's what happens too. A lot of people get turned off by it because people. Are misusing or misrepresenting it and um, stuff, but the um, divination system itself is is I'm telling you, it's embedded in our uh, in the African psyche. Every I know almost every, huh? I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
uh, whether it's effective or not is is the potency on the interpretation or allowing properly reading what it is that you are seeking in a solution. You know, if you're asking a, a question to seek answers to a solution, because everything is like balancement, and, and it's like the like in Kemet, Jehuti is the is the architect or the ultimate um, problem solver, re resolution. Mm -hmm. And 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 in the myth, you see that when he resolves the the conflict between Set and Heru, you know. Um, so the oracles of divination is like the resolution to different questions of, of society, your personal life, whatever. Even if you want to find out your purpose in life, people get a, a divination reading and things like that. So it, the potency comes in or the effectiveness comes in the proper reading of it. And then you got to do work. See, a lot of people will get a reading done, like tarot cards and stuff like that, and then that's it. But in, in traditional oracle systems, once you get a reading, man, you it's a burden. Because you have to put in the work, you have to you have to actually do some stuff. You once you get the reading, the reading is like your homework. Uh, the re just because you got a reading don't mean or the answer or whatever doesn't mean that like how how religious mind would treat it like a prophecy. Okay, it is what it is. It's gonna happen no matter what. Now you have to actually do a lot of work um, with it. And if you don't do the work, then it's not gonna be effective. So some people get turned off by it. You know. So, but still, so, um, so, yeah, well, I know, uh, everybody was probably fell, I know Garfield probably fell asleep, definitely Issa, <laughs> I don't know why he's still here, but, yeah. um, so, 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 since you, you, you a Hebrew Israelite? Mm. Right here, y'all, I ain't gone no damn, she on the damn fence. <laughs> you got, you got one foot in, one foot out. <laughs> yeah, she on the fence. What are you smiling at, Sar? Because I know you went to that debate. She's like, no, nah, I can't be associated with them no more. No, I was already the debate. <laughs> well No, they, already, they know how I feel. Like, I get called, I get called all types of names because I'm not like, hey, mute your damn mic, uh, aunt, please. <laughs> if you got disrespectful. <laughs> he really muted it. I was kidding. <laughs> No, but I mean, I just, I appreciate all information. So, but, um, you know, I mean, I started out hardcore Christian, you know what I'm saying? And then the more and more I learn, it's more, you know, I just, I don't really, want, I don't have a title. I don't even want a title. I don't, I don't want to put the creator in a box like that. So, you know, but. But they know how I feel. I get called all type of names because of things that I talk about and discuss and things I reject and whatever, you know, so that are within the scriptures and the whole Israelite doctrine that I think is just foolish. So I'm called Jezebel regularly. Why am I, what is, why do I see myself on the? Oh, that's because that's I'm sharing my screen, my bad. She's oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm seeing myself. No, um, but. Yeah, I mean, I understand. Uh, can y'all see my screen? Yeah. Fully? Okay, this is what I was talking about. And I want to show you that this is science, you know, and you, you can't knock it, uh, brother. Uh, uh. And I so ain't this, knocking this, nothing, yo. This is, this is, this is from my, um, my lecture on spirit. I have a totally different lecture on spirit. All right, and so um, this, is, this is from a Babalawa Joseph Ohamina in Benin. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he's describing what Odu Ifa and the structures are when we talk about Odus. So Odus, remember what brother uh what Jawu said earlier that the uh the natures can almost be uh considered as the laws, right? Mm -hmm. Is that am, am I saying that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a, that's exactly yeah. the nature the nature is like a, the embodiment of a composite of a, like a summary laws, you know. The, the, you know, anyway, yeah. Okay, and so, you know, I agree with you, and, and I've written that before, that the Netchers, the Orishas, the Odus, and things of that nature are, to an extent, are laws. And the stories you see are how these laws or the phenomena that are governed by these laws, when they interact, what happens. 
kind of like chemistry. And so um, when this this Babalawo here uh, talks about Ifa, he says the Odu of Ifa are structures of knowledge, autonomous but interdependent agents that shape and interpret the data saturated environment. And and I can't see, but I'm pretty sure that Brother Unk's mic is unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> but every hey, time uh, on my on my um on my screen I got uh this and this is why I, I was saying um how you know Ronald Fizz misunderstood a lot of times because he actually talks about that in this particular book it's called the Eleven Laws of God he goes to eleven Neturu and discuss the the most fundamental component of of the law that can cover almost you know all of existence can be narrowed down to eleven aspects and how nature governs this jurisdiction you know a law law is the premise for a jurisdiction and the jurisdiction can grow real wide and then it then it's then it's demarcated from another jurisdiction which is predicated by a law and so there's 11 natural rules and stuff so he talks about that in here all right um, can to continue he says uh, I'll just start again the old of Ifa are structures of knowledge autonomous but interdependent agents that shape and interpret the data structured environment providing portraits of intersubjectivity that are shared between artificial entities and ourselves dramatizing interaction between synthetic and organic life I'm hearing my echo again uh, provoking exploration and interaction that enhances curiosity in the face of emergent phenomenon which are beyond our control. They are agents, the Odus, elements of a system, sharing information, adapting and evolving with a changing environment, developing intricate interrelationships. They are spirits whose origin we do not know. We understand only a small fraction of their significance. They are brains behind the efficacy of whatever we prepare. They are spiritual names of all phenomena. When we're talking about the different Odus, so Edgy Ogbe, you know, anything of that nature, these are these are the names, these these represent spirits or laws, you know, in the universe. In existence, whether abstract or concrete, plants, animals, human beings, the elements, abstractions, such as love, hate, truth, and falsehood. All kinds of situations, concrete forms such as rain, water, land, air, and the stars. Situations such as celebrations, conflicts, ceremonies are represented in spiritual terms by the various Odu. And so the Odu is what I showed in the other presentation with the single and double strokes. So those signs, those Odus, those Medus in Medu Nature, you know, represent spirits. And so. Um, we have here Dr. Sylvester James talking about the Adinkras, and you can actually find a PDF of this. It's it's free that you can download in Physics World Symbols of Power. Uh, symbols of power, and so he's a theoretical physicist. You know, one of the few black theoretical theoretical physicists that we have a lot. And <laughs> he he was talking about how when in this in this text here that I'm gonna go back to the Physics World. Uh, the symbols of the Adinkras, how he discovered computer codes in the universe. And that when he maps them on a computer, we get these intricate designs. When he puts the formulas in, he gets these intricate designs. But he shows them in another way. This is from the actual article here. You see these uh, these nodes here? And it has, you know, representative, he talks about these energy configurations that he he labels them ones and zeros. And so you have these combinations, one, 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 zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, these different combinations. These are single leg odus, like what we see here. So what you're saying is on, 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 or light, 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 light 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 off same here on 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 off 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 this is darkness this is light and so we see the same thing going over here in these old dudes 
uh, what what I would consider others. He calls them adinkras, and so he's. I don't think he's too familiar with the the Yoruba system of Ifa. But when I read this, I'm like, this is Ifa. This is scientific proof that the Odus exist. And so when we we do divination and we're marking Odus, this is what we're marking: the fundamental laws, the spirit behind phenomena. And so. And, 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 and right. is, give me a week. Give me a week. I gotta. I gotta process that. Give me a week, bro. Hey, but hey, I want to <laughs> add to that, that diagram you just showed. You know, if you, oh, if, you if you um if you manipulate that diagram a little bit, you you'll see how it it can mimic the um the Venn diagram that's used that the so-called tree of life because like for example in Africa, spirit and a lot of people don't realize that spirit is a synonymous with energy. And everywhere energy is, is governed by law. So all these different energy systems are governed by a, a singular principle of law. So the nature becomes not only the spirit, but also the law of the spirit also. So it's, it's like a paronymy or a co combination of the energy and the law that governs it at the same time. So, and, and this is what becomes the so-called tree of life, uh, not, not the Kabbalah version, but yeah. What you know, I'm just saying what uh, Raul Nefer has um, has uh, written about and given. So that's why I'm saying I, I think, man, I think his his work is um, misunderstood a lot. But it's there if you read it. If you read the whole series, boy, I'm telling you, it's the same stuff we're talking about. Everything you saying, if you gave me time, I I can match up everything you saying with something that you know he wrote about. And 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 to to use what you uh, just said, like I I usually look at it in terms of complementary opposites and so the law the law doesn't the law doesn't have a physical form it doesn't exist in that way but all things are governed by law it's the hidden aspect of the universe energy can manifest itself physically and be seen you know based upon its speed you know in the universe and so it is dang it now I gotta go back because I gotta read this because this this helps us to make um make sense of what it is that he just talked about and because Maladoma Some talks about this in um, in his uh, I want to say this is a water and a spirit no the healing wisdom of Africa can you see my screen yep correctly okay so he says in the indigenous world the physical human constitution is regarded as an expression of mind. And one of the things that I was trying to get into in this, that spirit is actually mind. And that the laws is actually mind of consciousness. It's a consciousness that governs the, the physical world. So there's an intimate relationship between the energy form of spirit and the, uh, the mind aspect of it. But as an expression of mind and spirit, which is actually really the same thing. And a rather limited expression at that. The indigenous belief of the dagger is that we are primarily spirit, Odu. In order to exist as a material beings, we have to take a form. And there is the sense among my people that to be in matter is not the most familiar or suitable for us. Um, and and y'all familiar with the seven hermetic principles? Yeah. You know, so you know the first one is the principle of mysticism. All is mine. You know, and they're, 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 these are the laws, um, so to speak, in energy. So it shows that all of these things are interrelated. You know, the all is mine, and and so what I uh, I spoke about in uh, this in the lecture as well, uh, Fukial's work. And uh, let me see. Um, I'll skip that. Um, nip, nip. He was just kind of talking about that in terms of the weighing of the heart. And things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, going to the judgment scene, uh, Mach Heru. Uh, I told you about the opening of the mouth ceremony. And so here's a, for the earlier conversation. Here's the same. Here's a different scene. We see the woman in the in that position. Yep. Still on the other side. Now she's on the other side. You know, on on this side of uh, the mummy. Yep. But anyway. Um, on animation. Uh, four moments of the sun. Those are the Nyombo, um representations uh, 
uh, of of the mummies um, of the deceased king. Um, I didn't deal with it else in here. Um, yeah, I won't deal with it here. Um, but he he talks about how basically the invisible world, the the physical world, is just a, an extension of the invisible world. And so that's what these old dudes represent, and that's what it tells us. So what he's saying, Dr. Sylvester, is that the um, adinkras are the fundamental building blocks of the universe. And that we, we map them graphically, they're shapes. So remember what you was talking about earlier, that the mind thinks in shapes? Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, that's something that is fundamental to everything, especially why you see, for example... The um, the ancient Egyptians, people got to ask themselves this question. Why did they go through all these pains of writing the ancient Egyptian script and all of these scenes in funeral temples and tombs or whatnot that nobody was supposed to be able to see? Right, exactly. Like, it wouldn't make any sense if you're going to do all of that artwork and then shut the tombs up. And that nobody can see it. Who else is going to who's going to read it? Because it wasn't for the um for the living at that point. It was for the deceased. Remember that the ba is the mind, and the mind thinks in terms of shapes and pictures. And so the messages that they would send, just in case they couldn't hear and didn't have ears, so to speak, they definitely should be able to read the symbols. Which is why the ancient Egyptians never abandoned symbols, because this is all dealing with the mind. The mind is is what uh, it 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 gravitates towards um, um, shapes, objects, and so you know, being a programmer, you know about object-oriented programming. Why is that a better programming than any other kind of form of programming? Because yeah. our minds things in objects, shapes, things. And I'm gonna tell you that's why that's why <laughs> the rule is given the association with the imagery because our our ability to see pictures because what is a picture a picture is simply a an amalgamation of different pixels so when you when you separate the pixels or when you put together different pixels of different shades of color then you get your gradients and so on and so forth once you pull the focus back 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 then you start then an image emerges. And this is what we call imagination or imagery. But to zoom in on it would be to differentiate all of that stuff. And that's another component of, of the of the spirit, which allows us to, to be segregated, to separate things into all the itsy, itsy bitsy pieces. So we got two uh two complementary faculties of the spirit going on simultaneously, all within the mind that gives us these abilities, and, and nature is, is is set above it to govern it. And for example, Het Heru would be the imagination, imagination, which is where you get joy and stuff out of. And then Sab or Ampu and Wabwawet, which ties into the um, Brocrio uh, and Wakernapi or whatever some uh, centers in the brain that allows for speech and and cognition and stuff like that. So you know, it gets into some different uh, sciences. So and that's all explained. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Say ho hotep to a couple of uh, people that came in. Um, Sister Robin, hotep, hotep. Hotep. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this on the? Okay, well, bud. Ask him for her when she comes. Huh? I did y'all laugh when she said hotep? Got that grunt. Got it all. She said it all. She like hotep. You know, in in a, in a real meek voice. You know, we used to hotel black power. You know, people yelling. <laughs> yeah, like, <clears throat> my bad, my bad, my bad. Oh, it's not, it's not wrong. We just messing with you. It's like twelve. The, it's like one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Y'all must be always on. Man, yeah. speaking of that, let me let me let me do this. I'm just going to end the live feed because we've been on a while. We pretty probably we won't um oh, uh, yeah. go on to. Hey, hold on. But, uh, one one question, one question. When you why you on live? Um, somebody asked this in the um, they they're watching the live feed and asked this. I meant to mention it earlier, um, but it may man it may take too long. We got to do a separate thing. But there, but the question is, 
um, about Theophilo Benga. Um, uh -huh. The brother has been seeing us talk about Theophilo Benga in the Hangouts and on Facebook and stuff. So he 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 had went to his professor, I think, a linguist, and uh -huh. they're basically they're basically trying to dismiss Theophilo Benga as a pseudo linguist and saying <laughs> that his his work is not accepted, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if right now it'll be too long winded to to kind of go over that, but. Uh, I just want to put on the floor. Maybe we could do do that another time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean we can we can um we can we can deal with that now. Um, you know, for the record, and see, uh, you might, this you might long way. We might be here to about four in the morning. No, no, no. I'll I'll, I'll answer this and you know as quickly as possible because I mean, it's really it's really more so an issue of characterization, not um based on demonstration. And so remember that Theophilo Obinga, first of all, he's learned from some of the best linguists, you know, and, and went to school for this. He has certificates in this. And so he's not no armchair linguist. Um, secondly, <laughs> he, has, he has went up against the top scholar at conferences, you know, been on panels and challenged these, these so-called mainstream um, linguists you know, on these questions, especially with Afroasiatic. And so what happens is they do like with, um, you know, our One West brothers and, and the Hebrew Israelite machine <laughs> is that when they get beat up at a conference, <laughs> they'll try to come back home and be like, you know, we won the debate. Uh, he didn't prove his point. You know, all this other kind of stuff. But you notice they'll never, like you never see in print them discrediting Obinga in terms of a, a linguistic analysis, like a serious, like step by step breaking down why um, he is wrong in his analysis. You don't see it. You won't find it because they can't. And right. so um, everything at this point is just conjecture, it's just characterization, you know, about him. But they can't go by and 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 discredit what he's talking about. And and that's why it's important to 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 do this scientific work and be able to go to them in their places of study and challenge them on on their um their thesis. And so one of the major where we know about the 1974 Cairo symposium, but there was another one in Barcelona where Obinga challenged um and went against Eric Christopher Eric on on his uh Afroasiatic and made Christopher Eric buckle down. And admit that you know what is not as sound as we thought. That's Obinga making them do that. But because this um, this isn't like you know this happened at a time where it wasn't like on the video age really. You know they didn't they didn't tape. I, I think there's like a small portion of the tape. I don't know who has it. But even still, Christopher Aaron had to write a a letter to Obinga saying that he, he's right. So when you talk to Dr. Troy Allen, if you ever come across him, you know he'll tell you these stories. You know about uh, you know their time in um, Barcelona. In Barcelona, you know um, Mubabingi Bololo was there. Dr. Alan Anselin was there. Um, all challenging these European scholars on these on this linguistic and ancient Egyptian question. And so this is why I always say that demonstration beats conversation each and every day, each and every time. It doesn't matter how people characterize it. Once we start dealing with the primary scholarship and stuff like this, where do you stand? How can you demonstrate that I'm wrong? And they can't. And if you can't do that, you know, you need to fall back. You know, and you need to publicly apologize. I mean, that's that's how these, these linguists do. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, matter of fact, in Mboli's work, Mboli rips a hole, you know, in in these uh, Africanist linguistic works. Matter of fact, other European linguists, you know, um, talk talk badly about Africanus and Greensburg and them. So people got to keep understanding. This is why I keep stressing, especially like the brother Ngozi. Like, you know, he takes Christopher Eret at heart and believes everything that Christopher Eret say, not knowing that people have debunked Christopher Eret, white folks and black folks. And you won't call the white folks Afrocentrist. And so, you know, one, one person who rips Greensburg to shred is R.M. Dixon, you know, who's written some other texts, but I'm just showing you one of his texts here, The Rise and Fall of Languages, you know, who talks about the Africanist school 
and uh, of, of linguists. So there's a difference between Africanists and the African-centered, you know, linguists. So Africanists are these Europeans coming from the uh, school of Greensburg who just made up some um, language families, uh, phylums or whatnot, and then tried to do what the creationists do. They, they, have a, they have a belief in a truth first, and then they look for evidence for it. That's, that's the Africanists. That's Greensburg. That's how Af Afroasiatic came into being in <laughs> Niger, Congo, and Nilo Saharan. But, you know, when it comes time to actually demonstrating point for point that this stuff is indeed, in, in, um, indeed facts, then, um, you know, they fall short. And so we, there's many, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of scholars who, um, who, who discuss this. And that's not easy, that's not easy to find and um, bring up. But, you know, yeah, the, um, tell them to let, have a public conversation, you know, and, and debate about it, about in, in, in um, Dr. Obinga's work. And there's, there's even, you know, we got even some bigger beasts than, than Obinga that, you know, rips holes into these arguments. You know, but I'm sorry, somebody want to say something? Hey, I think, I mean, that's a routine, though. Like, like for instance, they routinely play the Sumerian card. They routinely, it's like they're the most arrogant people on the planet. If we didn't come up with it, then that shit ain't true. I mean, that's the game they play. You know, if yeah. you're not following the God I got, then the God you got ain't even a God. I mean, that's the game they play. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, they're going to discredit our scholars and term them Afrocentric, like you know what I'm saying? Like that's that's like a slur almost. No, you know they don't saying? discredit. Like, like they mischaracterize. You got to use those terms. They mm -hmm. they mischaracterize because the discredit would mean that they actually went you know point for point and um and and uh, disqualify each and every one of their claims. You know, but they haven't do that. They won't do that in print because they can't. You know, they do can only make character assassination. Uh, and, and misapplications or uh, um, um, mischaracterizations verbally and stuff like this. We hear it all the time. But, you know. That's arrogant. The fight, the fight for, I mean, come on now. They, we, we, we're on the continent of Africa at this particular juncture. And, and I think it was totally absurd to, 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 to even suggest that the people on the continent, you know what I'm saying, aren't indigenous. Or at least didn't start out indigenous. I mean, it's absurd, and that some people from Europe somewhere came in and built a civilization that they hadn't yet built in their own homeland. That's the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard in my life. And they routinely continue this thing. They continue with the Sumerians or or, or the Babylonian cultures. You know, they routinely say they brought in uh, uh, things that civilized uh, the Egyptians. And this shit is crazy. But yet they could not do it in their own homeland. I mean, it's ridiculous. Exactly. Now, we got to be careful about that argument as well because, you know, say, for instance, that we argue that they come from Central Africa and, you know, came to Egypt. The same thing, you know, people will say that, you know, well, we don't see no pyramids in Uganda in, in the Great Lakes region and all this other kind of stuff. Well, we know them primarily because we didn't have the same materials. But that, that's why you dig into the culture and the language. Because that's what's going to—that's going to be the difference. See, they can't connect themselves to anybody in Europe based on language and culture. But you—you um, you can't. Um, we can do that quite easily in Central Africa, and because of directionality and the phonemes, we can tell you which direction it was in, and any linguist would have to bow down to that point. And so we know that the culture, everything was fully formed already in Central Africa. When they came to the um, into yep. Egypt, yep. it just expressed itself in the art with the materials that they had, and because there was a confederation and they was able to build wealth and control trade, they were able to do it on a larger scale than some of these smaller communities. So this is why we see these cultural and, and psychological and linguistic, you know, ideas from Central Africa manifesting themselves creatively in ancient Egypt. And so even though we may not have the material in terms of, for instance, hieroglyphs, in terms of um, uh, pyramids and temples, and we got to remember this. For example, there was no need to build them in Central Africa. You want to know why? Yeah, mountains. <laughs> because the mountains all exist 
yeah. in Central Africa, yeah. and the temples represent forest. Those are your real temples. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to build fake representations of them. This is why your temple uh, pillars look like trees, because they're trying to emulate the original initiation schools in um, the, the forest areas. There's no forest in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So everything is an imitation of what used to be way back then, which is why um, a lot of the hieroglyphs, you can only find the real life representations, you know, from the Sudan on down that aren't native to ancient Egypt. Ain't no elephants in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. Why do you got a word for elephant and got a word in the hieroglyph for elephant? You know, you got a word for fan that is a plant that is found in Madagascar. Madagascar. <laughs> you know, that's not native to Egypt. All of this stuff comes from the south. This is how we can link, you know, even without pyramids and without um, these large temples, Central Africa to Egypt. But you can't do that the other way around. None of that stuff exists uh, linguistically, conceptually in the Middle East or in Europe. And you daggone sure don't see any tiger hieroglyphs. <laughs> so they try to say that Asians, <laughs> Asians are, um, like for example, I, I, I was trying to, I finally found it, I was looking for this quote from Mustala, Mustafa Gadala, where he says that the original inhabitants of Egypt came from, um, the origins of Egyptians are Asians. And he, he, he mirrors, you know, Budge and the other early Egyptologists that they are Asians and they came in and they are ca Caucasians and they came in and basically civilized the whoever was there and they're trying to say that whoever was there was very scarce and low numbers and they basically civilized them because some people were, were trying to use the dollar's work and I was like, well, do you agree with this? And I finally found a quote. Um, you know, but that, none of that makes sense because even in their linguistic or the, or the objects that will represent the, the glyphs in their speech and the psychology of, of the people doesn't match those things that you find in, in uh, Central Asia or um, in, uh, you know, the Middle East, Northern Middle East. <clears throat> exactly. exactly. And, um, you know, this is one of the, that, I mean, again, this is, this is one of those things that, you know, um, in um, what's his name, uh, Muba Benge Bilolo. Uh, let me see, is it in this book? It's probably in my other book. Um, you know, deals with as far as you know. Once we start getting into those hieroglyphs, you know, those hieroglyphs are still known by the same names in Central Africa. You know, with the same semantics. So how do you say, um, uh, what's one of the ways that you say uh, um, me in Egyptian? Me? Yeah. Like the, pro like the pronoun like me? Pronoun. Yeah. Uh, we? Not we in the, in, the, um, the, in the plural. I'm saying like I, me, my. No, no, I'm saying it's, 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 a, it's we. It's, um, no, no, okay. like, like we would say... Um, <laughs> Uh, Majetwi, my, uh, uh, he wrote, no, um, Jet, Jetwi, he, he speaks to me. Okay. Whatever. Now, that, I mean, that's just one way off the top of my head, we. The same, the same, uh, dang it, let me, I'm trying to find, see, I'm worse actually at my house, where I have all these different, okay. Like, uh, this is this is from one of um, Dr. Muba Binge Bilolo's works, and this is when when I invited him to Houston, when we brought him to Houston at the University of Houston, way back in like 2010. Um, you know, this was the handout that he gave us. Um, it's in German, uh, um, but uh, it'll be better than me trying to hold up a book. <laughs> But he said that one of the clues, like if you listen to that um, that lecture that I have about Mubinge Bilolo on on, U on YouTube, he talks about a clue. You know, um, you can you can say this is some form of divination. Um, but you know, you know, you know, uh, Dr. Mubabu Longo is right now going through therapy because last week he had a heart attack. And uh, or no, it's either a heart attack or a stroke. 
and you know, so you know, uh, Dr. Bilolo's an elder. But way back in like 1998, 1999, he had a stroke as well, or, or, or a heart attack, and so we almost lost him. You know, he had a, he had a few works out already that was really kind of from the 80s. You know, a little bit after his PhD dissertation was completed, and um, but you know, this new line, like when you start to see all these little blue books, you know, with this kind of cover, these are after these are post. Muba Binge Bilolo um, having his heart attack or, or his stroke from like 1998 from 1999. And what's unique about it, what, what he said in this conversation was that one day he was in his basement working on the heater and then he heard a voice in his head say, you think you smart, don't you? And Bilolo was, you know, he said that he answered the voice. You know, uh, what do you mean? And he said the voice says that you uh, you think you smart. And um, he said, how do you say the word for me in Chiluba? And so Bilolo said it. He said, ni. He says, what is the word for leaf or plant? And he said, this, this is what the voice said to him in his, uh, in his basement. And so he said that, you know, ni. And so he says, you still don't get it, do you? <laughs> so he asked him another question, you know. And so it was this that he figured out that, you know, of course, the, the voice in his head, now I don't know if he's exaggerating this for, you know, for drama and, and, and things of this nature, but this is the story that he says, that you can hear him on, on YouTube, you know, say this. And um, so what he did is that... <laughs> He went through, he just went through the Walter Bush, the Erman Grapphaw Walter Bush dictionary, and he decided that he's just going to look at the glyphs themselves and find out what's the glyph's name in his language. He's not going to go to the, 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 the hieroglyphic dictionary and just copy what they have already. He's going to bypass that all. I'm just going to look at what this sign means in my language and then I'm gonna put the word in my language and so I can get with the phonemes then from there I'm gonna go to each just go down the row for all these words I'm gonna put and match you know not necessarily match I'm just gonna put whether they match or not all the words you know that are associated with that one word and see what patterns that I find and he noticed that you know all these words for these glyphs he still has in his language, and that these are the, the, the ways that he pronounced. So he looks at the, the hieroglyphs differently. He doesn't do like kind of what we do, is that we go in the hieroglyph dictionary, and then we look at a word, and then we look for its definition. He doesn't do that. He goes into his language, finds a word, and then he and goes then he into goes the dictionary. dictionary. So he works backwards, and then he and makes he a list, and then goes through them one by one and he finds you know uh, matches and so this is how he was able to say that we aren't reading the glyphs accurately they're, they're mainly correct but there's 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 a pattern here in certain the glyphs that is matching my language and so this is what you see you know when you're analyzing so like for this book here this is the one that's written in all Chicam he's analyzing these glyphs and showing you, you know, the, um, the, the Rabus principle and how it works out. How these words that match these glyphs also match words that sound similar in his language for other phenomena, which we find in the ancient Egyptian um, dictionaries or the ancient Egyptian script. And so, um, you know, this, this lets us know, this inform us again that where these folks come from they come from Central Africa and these ideas and concepts you know was brought there and um, matter of fact I have a quote from Campbell Dunn where he's arguing that it's obvious that the hieroglyphs were meant to write a language that wasn't necessarily originally um, um, the, the, the Egyptian language and so the who became the ultimate Egyptian um, 
language speakers, the Middle Egyptian speakers, you know, they got these concepts, you know, from, from further down. And Mboli uh, reinforces that because in, in Shango, you know, all the words for the primary glyphs, he got, they got it in their language. Mm -hmm. And so you would use that principle that you were talking about earlier to read the glyphs. He could do it in their own language in Shango. And so how is this Shango is spoken in Central Africa, close to Cameroon, in, um, in the, um, the Republic of, uh, of Congo? You know, so, you know, it's, it's, it's this stuff that we, you know, a lot of this discussion isn't happening. Um, you know, and, and even with Mboli's work, that I sound should be me. And we know what? this. Are you saying me or me? Me is an I N Y. Oh, okay, I got you. Or N I. Um, that's mm -hmm. how, that's how it. That's where it comes from. And so it's a word for um, person in um, in in uh, in African languages. Me. And well, sometimes that's the, it can be used as a plural. If that's the case, then your first question when you say how you say me, mm -hmm. then it would be in. Um, Kimmy or Ronnie Kimmy will be uh, with me. Mm -hmm. But, but here's, 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 here's the kicker. Like, for instance, we know that this this symbol here, um, the reed leaf that is, is given as I, right. um, it's, it's in the word Ami, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, we say Ami based on this, this rendering. But... When you go amongst the Akan, they say Inyamini. Yeah, Inyame, yep. Inyamini. In and so, and, and the short without the N suffix is just Inyame. We say Inyame or Inyame, Inzambe in Congo. And so, this would correlate with that. And so, it's just the N is dropped. But this originally was me, because there's no vowel. Remember, everything is a syllable. Everything is monosyllabic. And so it's a weakening of the end. And so you say me. So when you say amen, it's really yami or nyamani. Mm -hmm. They still say it in, um, they say in yame, but they also say in yamane in, um, in Congo. I mean, not Congo, in Akan. And so, you know, it's, it's knowing this, you can't find this in Europe. You can't find this in Semitic. You know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, this being the R sound consistently, the, the, the vulture symbol. Consistently we can find this. Now, um, Bilolo doesn't match this with R or L. You know, I do, and I find it all the time in, you know, me and him have had a discussion, and I keep telling them that this is, this is mainly a RL sound. So when when you see writings in his work, he doesn't match it with an RA. He matches it with an A. Mm -hmm. I mean, the RL sound. He matches it with an A. So, um, but that's how he's like, you know, the t, the so-called feminine T is prefixed in um, in in um, Chiluba uh, and things of this nature, and. Uh, you know, and there was a part in there. See, this is and this is what gets me. I don't know if this was actually put on the tape. I need to review it again. But at the at the um, at the lecture, you know, because my I have this camera here. I don't know if you have one of these, you know, DSLR cameras. But this one only records in twenty minute increments, and then this gets hot really quick. And so I had to, every 20 minutes, I had to stop and then start the camera over again. Then there was a point in the time when my camera got hot and I had to let it cool. And so we missed a part of the lecture in, um, that I have of Dr. Bilolo speaking at U of H. And mm -hmm. so I think in, the, in what's part of the missing, he was talking about how some of the pharaohs in the ruling class and the ruling families made their way into Central Africa. And this is how we know. Like, he was giving the whole breakdown. I'm like, man, I wish I had this on tape. Mm. So, you know, because I, re I just remember the conversation in general, but then I can go back and further study. Because, again, it's 
we're starting to see a lot of this stuff in these royal families, especially like with Ra. R the Ra royal family is in, still in Central Africa. You know, and so when you say Sa-Ra, you know, uh, this unifier thing, still in Central Africa, still the same name. His his ethnic group, Dr. Mubai Binge Bilolo's ethnic group, is named Wasar, or Asar, which is why uh, is Bashalinga, but it's it's Washalinga. The Wash the Washalinga is the single, and then Washalinga, I mean Bashalinga is the plural. So he's he's part of an ethnic group that is named after Osiris. Mm. You know, and so, um, but anyway, um. Yeah, I don't want to you know, take too much like time. It's <laughs> like a six-hour hangout. Well, I don't know, but you got to, you got to definitely download this and chop it up. <laughs> you know, but um, but I'm I'm gonna end it here. You know, uh, I like to thank everyone. You know, if y'all want to stay on, uh, you know, and talk afterwards, you know, we can do that. But I'm gonna end the live uh, feed. So we went we went all over the gamut. Again, it was Freestyle Friday, so we really didn't have a central focus, and um. Yeah. And so, you know, that's it is what it is. But I appreciate everybody for hanging with us as long. Uh, the 13 folks who are viewing right now, <laughs> you know, I know y'all y'all must be in another time zone because it's, it's almost 2 o'clock, you know, uh, here. But um, I appreciate y'all for listening. Uh, I'm going to end it. And, you know, for my people on the panel, if you want to continue the discussion, we can do that most definitely. All right. Peace. <laughs>